At that time, very occasionally, the college would conduct internal searches to fill tenure positions. Trustee Banducci believed that that practice was inappropriate, arguing that full searches needed to run. Since that time, it is very, very rare that the college does internal searches for faculty positions. Full searches are conducted. Yet recently it has been suggested that there are faculty members prepared to step into the role of vice president. If the same process that was used to select the interim president is used to select the VPs, the college will again um, deny due process, be in violation of college policy, and commit the very practice that uh, Chair Van Ducci railed against in 2014. Okay, you're, you're quite a bit over now. I gave you a little extra time. You're at almost 2.30. I think you're done now. Thank you. Appreciate um, your comments. One sentence? No, no, you're, you're two, over 2.30. It was a nice one. <laughs> you got extra time. I gave you extra time. Um, Ms. Rose, you said you're ready, I believe. Bear with me because I'm having to read around scratch outs, please. I would like to address item number five. Ms. Michael Barnes has been my neighbor in zone five until he sold his house and moved. This move has disqualified him from holding office based on Idaho statute 59901, which reads in part, every elective civil office shall be vacant upon the incumbent ceasing to be a resident of the state district or county for which he may have been elected. Prior to closing on his property, Mr. Barnes had been living in Arizona from January 2021, but the better part of the last six years, what has been confirmed, he has a P.O. Box mailing address since 2016. Merely a summer visitor to Kootenai County, this transient living arrangement defies being a bona fide legal taxpaying Kootenai County resident. Living in a travel trailer parked on the property of another without a permanent resident elsewhere is a violation of Kootenai County Code 84401. Be, um, being in violation of Idaho law by remaining on the NIC Board of Trustees creates reason to question whether Mr. Barnes' votes have been legal and valid. Sorry. Uh, recently, Mr. Barnes resigned his position on the KCRCC stating he had moved. Mr. Barnes has taken advantage of the availability of Zoom. Without Zoom, he could not otherwise participate in NIC board meetings given to his absence from the county. In perpetuating the lie that Mr. Barnes is a current legal resident of Kootenai County, he and Mr. Banducci have violated good faith standards and their fiduciary duty. To end the pattern of deceit, an immediate resignation is in order from Michael Barnes for the same reason he resigned from the KCRCC. Mr. Barnes should not vote on the zoning under consideration or anything else from here forth as NIC trustee. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Ms. Elliott. Board of Trustees, North Idaho College meets the diverse educational needs of students, employers, and the Northern Idaho communities it serves through a commitment to student success, educational excellence, community engagement, and lifelong learning. NIC is a strong institution, but what can challenge its ability to fulfill its mission statement? Recently, we were informed that students and community members are calling more often about NIC's accreditation status. The very feel real possibility NIC could lose its accreditation status with the Northwest Commission on Colleges and Universities is of important concern to the Northern Idaho community. Communication is also needed by this board to local and Northern Idaho businesses stating that accreditation will be protected, safeguarded and is crucial. Communicating a level of priority to accreditation and speaking to and on NIC's currently challenged accreditation status is the responsibility of this board and vital to provide clarity and understanding as to next steps 
each of you will be taking to fulfill requirements articulated by the NWCCU. Will the NWCCU see the required ne necessary established pattern of acceptable behavior actions taken by this board? I recommend a formal accreditation discussion event be scheduled, recorded, and posted on NIC's website site beside the other recorded trustee meetings. The discussion event should provide answers to the many questions which have been and are continuing to be received to North Idaho College's main office. Pre-screened questions could be presented to trustees by student and faculty members of NIC's communication department. A recorded event like this would be ideal for accessibility to those communities who require and or benefit from accommodations. Cynthia, how much more do you have? You're, you're over two minutes. Two sentences. Okay. And would benefit those that need social distancing. Now is the time for the NIC Board of Trustees to reach out and formally provide its constituents answers on the board's intentions for the future. Thank you for my time. Thank you for your comments. Ms. Clark. Good evening. My name is Marcy Clark, and I'm a parent of an NIC student who's currently enrolled in the automotive program. Um, my question for the board is um, I watched the, the initial board meeting where you got rid of the mask mandate. I was present for the second board meeting where uh, President McLennan was relieved of his duties, and there was no public comment. There was no ability as a parent to weigh in on any of the decisions that would be affecting my son. So my question is for the current presidential search, are you going to be engaging the community? Are you going to be asking parents or have a diverse group who are not going to be just handpicked minions to be doing the search? I, ideally, I would like to see a diverse, as a parent of a stu current student, doesn't have to be me, but I would love to see a diverse group of people on the search committee for the, for the new president for next year. Thank you. Um, Mr. Laponzi. Good evening, trustees, and thank you for allowing me to speak. As a uh, former firefighter, for 29 years, uh, been through many different fire chiefs that have been appointed during heavy political opportunities and pressure and it's caused difficulty within the rank and file. And, but once again, because of political appointments, there was uh, often objection. And so by picking department heads to run ahead of an organization, there's a, a lot often time in government agencies and government run agencies, there's gonna be politics involved. And so you guys were a duly elected board and politically you have the power and clout to do some of the things that you do. But one thing I'd like to point out is that we all need to, to take a breath, slow down and find out on this presidential search how to slow down and not rush through the process. I know every time that we hired a group to appoint a fire chief and it was done rapidly, that fire chief always failed the community and the needs of the department. So I think instead of rushing and hurrying to get through, we have an interim president, we should reevaluate reevaluate and slow down the process to allow the process to work its way through and to make sure that the, the group that we do pick to do the hiring process has enough time to thoroughly vet good applicants instead of putting it under a time pressure and just throw names at you to meet the time constraint. So I'd ask that the board consider slowing down the process. If it takes a little bit longer, at least we can vet and get a good president and vice president to run this community college. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Mr. Dunlap. Mr. Chair and board members, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak with you tonight. 
I want to talk about the presidential search process and hiring processes. The search for a new pre and I'll try and read this as fast as I can uh, to get through it. The search for a new president is one of the most significant instances of shared governance in the life of a college, but it is also uh, the most challenging. The process of selection is fundamental in determining which candidate has the appropriate academic leadership and administrative skills needed to lead the institution and which organizations will serve on the search committee. So will this board commit to an open, transparent, fair, and inclusive process? Well, the best indicator of future behavior is past performance. In selecting an interim president, there were 10 applicants. At the last NIC Foundation meeting, I asked Mr. McKinsey why none, absolutely none of those 10 applicants were interviewed and how could the board conduct an open, transparent, and fair process without interviews? He was dumbstruck and had absolutely no answer to that question. It appears the capricious appointment was made contrary to NIC policy 3.02.03. We now understand that two vice presidents are departing and other senior administrators are being told they may not be here for long and there may be organizational structural changes in the wind. Will those positions be filled in accordance with um, college policies or will replacements just be appointed in violation of NIC policy and accreditation standards? So the operative question is, how can this board be trusted to conduct an open, transparent, fair and inclusive process for the permanent position based on past behavior and will all constituents vested with vested interests in the future well-being of NIC be representative? And who we're talking about are business and industry, county, city, and regional governmental agencies, regional workforce and economic agencies, secondary and other higher educational partners, hospitals, and medical providers, and faculty and staff. To ensure NIC meets the diverse regional education, economic, and student needs in a fair and transparent process, rather than accepting a particularly chaotic and autocratic ideology uh, represented by this board, constituents need to demand a seat on the search committee. Constituents demand that you are present at that table to help select a new president. Thank you. Okay. Got a little extra time there. Um, B-E-H-M, Pat, and I don't know if it's a, thank you, sorry. And I didn't want to say Mr. or Ms. because it said Pat and I wasn't sure. It's all right. My name is Pat Baim. I've, I'm a retired teacher, but I taught in North Idaho for 36 years. Um, 17 of those years, um, I taught a night class for NIC, practical woodworking. And um, uh, so I've done a lot of things around this part of the country. And um, during my tenure with uh, the CDA school district, I took part in the selection of a principal. In that group of people who helped that selection process were, um, were teachers and staff, support staff, our, our student council, um, principals from other schools, and higher administrators in the district. So there's a wide variety of people who took part in the selection process of this principal. I'm just telling you my personal experience. Um, the process was three-day public affair during which um, we all had part in the interviewing, vetting, questioning of four applicants for the principal job. Um, when the principal was selected, well, the principal was selected and that principal is still in that position 14 years later. It's been a stabilizing force and um, has done a very good job. I've been in touch with teachers who I know for many years and work for this person. And I'm just saying that it was a stabilizing force to, to know that everyone had some input. Everyone who had a, a dog in the, in the game had input and it was very important. Um, so proper vetting um, 
is a stabilizing force. It's a stabilizing factor for both the school and the community. Um, and I want to also say that- um, Pat, Pat you're, you're over two. Are you okay. close to done? Or and so, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty well done. And okay. so stabilizing, a stabilizing force for this institution, knowing as a in industrial arts teacher that the community has a lot of people who are in industry and those industry people need consistency thank, as thank well as the the other folks at the college thank you pat so thank you welcome. for your comments uh, ms meyer Good evening. My name is Judy Meyer. I've been a board member here and I've also been on the State Board of Education. I speak to you tanight, first of all, good evening to Chair Banducci, Trustee McKenzie, Howard, here I am, <laughs> Barnes and Wood. I speak to you today about the athletic, the search process here. I urge you to include community members. The community college is just that a college funded by local taxes to provide remarkable options. And as we've heard earlier, there are very many programs that need local input. We heard also about trustee zones and the effort to be sure that the community is represented well by ha having zones in which people then are sure to represent that area. I think that's an important concept we need to explore some more. I believe it is your responsibility to include the community in the search process for a new president. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Mr. Duncan. Chairman, board members, thank you for letting us speak this, this evening. My name is Doug Duncan. My daughter goes to school here, carries a full load. Uh, I just wanted to speak about the presidential search and the process. I am encouraging you to slow down, take your time, do it right, involve the people that need to be involved with community and industry, and also um, don't, don't be rushed. So just take your time, do it right. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the public comment. Next on the agenda is the item under special business. The tab one, the board books, uh, election of officers. Chairman Banducci, yeah. I'd like to uh, nominate Trustee Banducci as chair. Right, we have a Motion that has been made. Do we have a second? I'll second that. I have a second on that motion. Uh, Trustee Barnes, you made the motion. You have the first opportunity to speak to the motion. I don't have any prepared comments for that right now. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Are there any other comments or questions? Yes. Um, when, and I there's, we haven't called for any other nominations. There's only your nomination. Generally, we call for several nominations. So would I like would call I would call for the nomination of uh, Trustee Ken Howard to serve as chair. And under discussion, uh, I do have some points to make. This is my 17th year as a trustee. And this year with Trustee Banducci as chair has proven to be the most destructive and harmful in the history of the college. He has led the charge to violate a number of policies, fire president without cause, fill an interim position without proper interviews of candidates, completely disregard the policy and spirit of shared governance. And we find ourselves in a major lawsuit. We're facing serious threats to accreditation. For these reasons, I cannot support Todd Banducci for board chair. This is a critical time for the college to have experienced steady leadership as we address many serious issues. Ken Howard has demonstrated such leadership in the past and is the best choice to lead us now. There's a motion. 
for Ken Howard to be chair. There's already an existing motion. Motion to second. Trustee Barnes, with your indulgence, instead of uh, a motion, would you, and I'd need Trustee McKenzie to rescind his second, if you would, and Trustee Barnes to rescind his motion for the moment, and Trustee Barnes, if you would make a nomination for, instead of a motion for president, or for, excuse me, for uh, board chair. If I stated it as a motion, I withdraw it. I nominate Trustee Van Ducci as chairman. Thank you. Trustee McKenzie, you withdraw your second? Uh, I do, and I'll second uh, the new nominee. All right, thank you. All right, so we have two nominations on the floor. Um, Trustee Howard for chair and Trustee Van Ducci for chair. All those in favor? Wait. Well, I guess, are there more comments or questions? Yeah, I do have comments. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, Trustee McKenzie. Um, I just think it's important to provide specifics to claims, which none have been provided in prior statements. And um, also, I, I think it's specific. Um, if people go back to the date when an assault happened over here, and Chair Banducci and his responsibilities of being chair uh, stood up to take control of the situation. And as uh, Trustee Wood uh, contributed to the Senate chaos and calling for Chair Banducci to sit down and start the meeting, I responded to Trustee Wood as in, Trustee, will you please let Todd be chair? To which she responded in the negative of saying, no, I will not. You can check the video. I can even get you the times. But I just feel like that's described this past year. And um, I would just be, wish people respect. Uh, Todd was elected this past year, and I feel like you've done a great job running our meetings. And um, that's all I have to say. Uh, Mr. Chair. Just a moment. Uh, Trustee Barnes and Trustee Howard have not had the opportunity to speak yet. I want to give them each an opportunity. First, I'm, I'm happy to let the discussion go as it has. Um, I think we need to get to a vote and move along. Yes, sir. Trustee Barnes, are you mirroring uh, Trustee uh, Howard's at this moment, moving forward? Yes, sir. Nothing further. Thank you. And Trustee Wood. Thank you. I would just like to remind the board that part of the the letter back to the accreditation commission that was made public, we very firmly, first of all, acknowledged some of the issues with the current board chair. And we also made it very clear that we would revisit board leadership. So I don't know if we're gonna make a decision tonight that really says we don't acknowledge it anymore at all. We don't care what is on the line with accreditation, but it feels like it's headed that way. I think it's um, it's quite shocking that we find ourselves in this situation when we've acknowledged to the accreditation commission that we need to to go with a different leadership. All right. All those in favor of voting for Trustee Howard for chair, please say aye. 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 All those in favor of voting for Trustee Banducci for chair, please say aye. 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 The vote is three to two. We have uh, opened nominations for vice chair. Are there any nominations for vice chair? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would nominate Ken Howard for vice chair. Okay, I have a nomination for vice chair of Trustee Howard. I would uh, nominate Trustee Barnes. I have a nomination of Trustee Barnes for vice chair. Are there any nominations? 
All right. Any comments or questions regarding the nominations for vice chair? Mr. Chair, discussion? Discussion, Trustee Wood. I don't, I don't personally have any issue with Trustee Barnes, but uh, um, I don't, I don't even hardly know him. Um, but from what we heard tonight, I think we are probably gonna have to have some discussion about residency in the future. So I suppose if he's voted in as vice chair, that's something we'll just take up later down the road if his residency is a, an issue. I would just say consider the source. Well, the irony of that is actually we have two trustees that travel a lot and spend a lot of time out of the state. So uh, I don't need, know that we need to poke at either of them. Okay, all those in favor of Trustee Howard for vice chair, please say aye. 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 All those in favor of Trustee Barnes for vice chair, please say aye. 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 Trustee Barnes is vice chair. The floor is open for nominations for secretary treasurer and for clarification, secretary and treasurer can be two separate positions, but we years before my tenure on this board decided to combine those two into one. So secretary treasurer is served by a, a singular individual. So the nominations for uh, secretary treasurer. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. I know Ken Howard. Oh, sorry, just a moment. Uh, I have a nomination from Trustee Wood for Trustee Howard. Okay. And Trustee Barnes, what were you going to say? I was going to say the same. Okay. Mr. Chair, I decline any to serve as Secretary Chair. Okay. So I have two nominations for Trustee Howard, and he has indicated that he will decline the position, decline the nominations. Do we have any Third. further nominations? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would nominate Christy Wood. All right, Trustee Howard has nominated uh, Trustee Wood for Secretary Treasurer. Uh, Mr. Chair, I decline. Chairman Banditchi, I'm uh, resolved, I guess, resigned to nominate uh, uh, Trustee McKenzie for the position. Okay, we have a nomination on the floor uh, from Trustee Bars. Now we'll say this uh, to Trustee McKenzie, since the uh, prior two trustees have declined that position. Mr. Lyons has informed me that we could, if, if, you were, if you were inclined to take the position, that's fine. If you're inclined not to take that position, uh, Mr. Lyons has informed me that we could potentially assign that to someone that is not a trustee, uh, potentially uh, Miss Goodrich or, or someone else, but uh, she might be the most logical. So I, I guess uh, it's your choice if you'd like to accept that nomination in the position or not, but either way, I don't want you to feel obligated that you have to do that. Um, <clears throat> I, I would accept the position on the condition that Christy and Ken are welcome to assume the position roles if they choose to desire, but I shall take it as long as the board deems that wise. I accept. Okay. Then just know that they are invited. You still need a board vote. Yes, sir. Oh. All right. We have a nomination on the floor and a, a willingness to accept the position. All those in favor of Trustee McKenzie as the secretary treasurer for the board, please say aye. 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 All right, uh, the motion carries. 
for the nomination. I'm opposed. Majority. I'm on my vote as an opposition. Recording. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all those opposed, please say nay. 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 All right. Next on the agenda is constituent reports. We have ASNIC. Good evening, board and Dr. Sibeli. I have something to share. Um, I have updates for what we did for a month, and I will start with the Kootenai Health Hospital project collaboration that we did with ASNIC. And I have some photos to share. I will start with design. Um, this is the design that was done for the project. Thank you. And the second one is the um, design. And then we started um, creating a draft with the, the sketch with the um, chalks. And it took us about 14 hours to complete the whole sign. And this is how it looks from the um, rooftop. And it says, we love our healthcare workers. It's something small, um, but nice for the healthcare heroes uh, that are serving. And um, another thing that I have to update a security department update is that we had a meeting with Alex Harris and um, he updated us on the emergency phones and blue lights. Um, they have been replaced with the 24 seven live cameras and the bottom buttons to call. And we also have the programs Safe Walk and Green Dot Training, which is bystander education that aims to prevent the violence with the help by bystanders. Also, we had update from Chris Rush, um, Sodexo. They just uh, had the survey that participated, 128 people participated, which is actually above what they expected, um, 100 people. They expected to um, have 100 people to participate, faculty, students, and staff. Um, 4.3 out of five is the satisfaction rate. And um, cafeteria is constantly trying to improve and add something special, something new to the uh, menus. And we always have conversations with them. And um, vending machines, we also have two vendors that are um, actually one of them is local based in Spokane and um, Pepsi and Empire vending machines. They all uh, update the machines and um, they're actually responsible for maintenance. And those are updates for tonight. Questions or comments? Trustees, questions or comments? Can Michael still hear us okay? I see we've lost the video. Are we still okay with the yes, audio? Yes, I am. No. Sorry, okay. I had to step away for a minute. No, that's just fine. I want to make sure we're still good with the weather and with everything going on. Just want to make sure we hadn't lost you. I don't know if you're aware, we've had a tremendous windstorm today. So just, just to narrate for those that are watching it. Oh, there it is. It's on Zoom. Nope, it's still not on Zoom yet, but uh, they're right outside Kootenai Health. They did awesome. Uh, Thanks to our healthcare heroes. I, I wish the picture could be on Zoom. It's not. So. Any, anything else, anyone? Thank you for your report. Thank you. Faculty assembly. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Board of Directors, Chair Banducci, uh, distinguished guests. A faculty assembly met last Thursday, the 11th. Um, prim we primarily uh, handled two um, topics. The first, I presented an accreditation and the economic impact um, based on the EMSI 2017 executive summary. And I'll just give you a few um, highlights from that. Accreditation uh, is very important to our pocketbooks in this community. And I see its students and alumni added over $181 million in one year, fiscal year 15-16, um, to the local economies of the five Northern counties of Idaho. So it's a big deal for all of us. 
And I see employees over 1,000 full and part-time um, employees who are community members. The community receives $4 for every $1 the community invests in the college. So accreditation is more than just credits um, and good standing. It's, it's an economic powerhouse to this community. And I hope that our chambers of commerce um, and industry are hearing this. Secondly, we met with Mike Sabali. Um, thank you so much for coming to visit. Uh, we enjoyed our time with him and we're looking forward to working with him. I wanna end, uh, close this tonight with letting um, everyone know our faculty are working harder than ever before. We've always been known for exceptional instruction and that's still ongoing. Um, Morale has taken a hit for sure. But please understand that we are masters at our crafts. We're masters at our discipline and we're masters at educating our students. The focus has always been our students. That's why we're here. We have the best and brightest faculty. People want to work and live in Coeur d'Alene at this beautiful and work at this beautiful college on the lake. And because of that, we are able to uh, retain and uh, recruit the best faculty, um, I would say, in, in the country. In addition to teaching, engaging, and preparing for our classes, we're also spending a lot of time reassuring our students that their credits are okay, their credits are safe, and they're in good hands in our classrooms. So please, please, please don't lose confidence in the great, amazing people who are here to educate our students. Finally, um, Dr. Sabali did tell me um, that our board chair, Todd Banducci, has accepted our invitation to visit faculty assembly for our December meeting. I'm, we're very looking forward to that and just to end this year um, as best we can and as strong as we can. Thank you. I will stand for questions. Questions or comments? I have a, a couple comments, if I may, unless somebody else. First off, hopefully everybody recognizes that there has been no drop off in the delivery of education in this, in this institution, whether it be here or, or Sandpoint or the Parker Technical Center. Our instructors are doing an amazing job. They've continued to do what they do throughout everything over the last year the last nine years I've been on the board. And so if anybody thinks any of that's been disrupted, you would be mistaken. Uh, day to day, everybody's going to work, doing their job, teaching and imparting, imparting knowledge. And, and I guess one thing I, I will say, and I, I was gonna save this for later, but I, I think I'm gonna do it right now because it might just be timely. There's been a lot of concern about accreditation and it's a, it's a, a timely topic. And, some have questioned whether trustees care about accreditation. Well, of course we do, tremendously. At least I know I do, and I've not heard anything from any of the other trustees that says anything different. In case you've missed, anybody doesn't understand, I, I have a bachelor's degree, I have a master's degree. I had hoped to maybe even pursue a, uh, a PhD, but uh, I was in the military and my service interrupted any opportunity to, to pursue that. Uh, I had just started out uh, and, and not just in soft subjects. I was at Air Force Academy. I have engineering. I have economics. My master's degree was through the OR department. Uh, thesis through electrical engineering, 270 pages sponsored by NASA. So uh, highly technical in the School of Engineering out of the AFID, out at Wright Pat Air Force Base. Pretty rigorous, kind of the academy on steroids. So yeah, I, I understand accreditation. I understand the importance of education. And I believe all the other trustees do too. And, and I hope everybody's hearing that, and especially the media. Um, anybody that says different is disingenuous or, or, or is mistaken. Um, if, if they don't believe that we don't understand that accreditation is important. We recently had an email that came, and I'm not gonna give the individual's name, but they had some of these same questions. You know, are my credits good? If they lose accreditation, what happens? If, you know, and, and all the different questions that come with that. Then one of our senior staff replied to that. And, and I want you to hear this reply because it can seem like the sky is falling sometimes and we get, we get caught up at, at the 10 foot view and we, and we lose the perspective of the 10,000 foot view. And, 
and, and, and the response was, I appreciate you taking the time to express your concern about NIC's accreditation and how it may impact you as a student. I hope to alleviate some of your concern by answering your questions. And, and again, this is not my response. This is one, one of our senior, senior people uh, who knows what they're talking about. First, it's important for you to know that North Idaho College is currently in good standing with the Northwest Commission on Colleges and Universities, that's NWCCU. There is a process the commission uses to review colleges that may be out of compliance with standards and eligibility requirements. The commission provides the college an opportunity to take corrective action to remain in good standing. NIC is working to correct the current areas of concern. It would likely take two to three years for the college to lose accreditation if NIC does not correct the areas of concern. If you graduate or transfer from NIC while it is still in good standing, your credits will transfer to a four-year college or university. There currently is no reason to consider tuition reimbursement. NIC remains a quality institution of higher education. I firmly believe the education you are receiving at NIC will serve you for the rest of your life. I hope this information has been helpful to you. If you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. And then there was the article by Greg Mason the other day, and it was talking to um, Dr. Ram Swamy, I believe it's pronounced. I hope I don't get that wrong. And about some inquiries and, and a letter and, and some different things. And one of the things I'll just draw of it really quick is just this one sentence. He says, revocation of institutions accreditation, if it were to occur, is an outcome, is an outcome based on a very detailed process that could take a few years, Ram Swamy said. So just for everybody to understand this, this isn't something that happens like this and overnight. This is something that, as mentioned, we've built this over 80 plus years and we are respected a institution of higher learning. And it's not like tomorrow somebody's going to say, you did this or you did this or somebody did something and we're going to lose our accreditation. In fact, I would be willing to bet a, a pretty good dinner that these folks are going to work with us in every way possible as long as it takes to, to do whatever it takes for us to maintain our accreditation. And, and in the worst case scenario, if we were to lose it, anybody that's that's been to this college before, while we had it, those credits are all still good. And everything that's happened is still good. And all the degrees are still good. So even if somehow that happened, which I think is an infinitesimal possibility, everybody still is fine up to that point. And again, I, I don't think that's even have enough of a probability to even consider as an option. So I think we're gonna be fine. We, we're, we've got a new president with a lot of energy and uh, I'm excited to see how he leads this college. We've got a strong leadership. We're, we're making some transition there. But we've got a lot of good people in the bullpen. Uh, you know, we're, we're a strong team. So I just want to put everybody at ease. All these concerns about accreditation, I hope the media is writing this down. We are not going to lose our accreditation tomorrow, next week, next month, or even next year. This is a process that takes two to three years, or in his point, a few years. And that's from the head of the accreditation folks. Okay. That doesn't mean we don't take this serious because we do. And, and we're concerned. And those of us that are educated understand that. But please, let's, let's not hype up this and, and use it as a weapon and, and get everybody worked up un, unnecessarily. We're, we're going to work through this and we're going to be fine. Mr. Chen, yeah. we take it serious. I, Trustee Howard. I'm assuming that was some kind of a question to the reporter, but since it wasn't really, um, I do want to make a comment that um, you're correct. It's a long road to get um, um, credit, accreditation revoked. The problem is we're on that road. We shouldn't be on that road. We have no right to be on that road. We need to correct it now. We shouldn't say we've got two or three years in order to make the, to get caught at it and, and to, to get um, our, our accreditation taking place. There is no panacea there. We are on the wrong road and it needs to be corrected now. Well, I would agree, but I would also try to keep it in perspective as you raised your voice and got excited there and a lot of emphasis there for effect, because you're right. But again, had it been something serious, they'd have said, well, give us a report in 10 days or give us a report in a month. No, they said, hey, give us a report by the 1st of August. Gives us time to work through it, and we will. And so we're on that path. That's correct. But again, Chair, if I, may. I just want to mention to everybody that's worried, because the point is we are still educating. We're still doing a good job. We're still working. Everybody, we're moving forward. I appreciate the express support 
for Dr. Sabali. Thank you for that. Um, Trustee McKenzie. I think, I think we're, it's not necessarily addressed to the uh, faculty assembly. Do you have anything else or any other questions for her? But I would like oh, to say something to the accreditation. Let me do it. anything else for, for Molly. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I just, um, oh, uh, let's coordinate how that's going to work for time and all that. Absolutely. Um, we'll be in touch with Shannon and Super. do that. Thank you. Thank you. And, with Trustee regard, McKenzie, with regards to the accreditation, this board absolutely looks forward to uh, taking action and is take has is has um, taken action on the plan put out by the accreditation uh, suggestions. So, uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, we're actively working on it, and I know the new president has already looked at it and is addressing the items. Mr. Chair, Trustee Wood, since you're taking comments on this topic. Um, I, I would have to concur with Trustee Howard. I, I feel that there's a little bit of defensiveness on your part. And um, I would agree that we need to take it seriously. But I also would caution not to minimize it. Um, just in the article that you referred to by Greg Mason with the spokesman review, there's another complaint headed our way, possibly. So I think um, it's nice to say, we want to do all the right things, but then you just literally went through an election of officers that <laughs> went against what we said we would do to the, with the accreditation commission. Well, Christy, I'm sorry. You thought that was a defense of myself. Actually, I, I was trying to speak for positively about the college. Maybe that's a practice you can work on. The things that you've said and done over the last year have all too often undermined both this board and the college and our legal counsel. So maybe you could act in your fiduciary capacity and be the trustee you need to be and be positive and support the board and support the people that are in the positions on the campus, including the new president. So that would be greatly appreciated instead of working your agenda to your constituency and having them all lined up to say what you want them to say. It gets old there too. Well, so that's quite the, the next, Mr. It, Chair. it was, and I think it's quite true. Uh, staff assembly, please. But I do wish to also address before, um, there was plenty Trustee of- Trustee McKenzie. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. Forgive me for jumping in. Uh, there was plenty of people who wished to uh, speak for public comment who could not make it due to the uh, rough weather and high winds tonight. So. Okay. You ready? Yes, Okay. Please. <laughs> Good evening, Chair Banducci, other trustees. Dr. Lyons, Dr. Sabali, welcome to your first board meeting. Um, to our guests here in person and of course on Zoom, uh, staff assembly conducted our last meeting on November 11th, so just last Thursday. Uh, we covered the usual order of business. Uh, I am excited to share the Sterling Silver Award recipient for the month of November. It went to JT Thompson, uh, who is a financial aid advisor in enrollment services. JT has been recognized as being an outstanding coworker and has shown time after time his dedication and pride to helping students. Uh, our meeting on the 11th, it was fairly light compared to past meetings and did not include any guest speakers. Uh, there was one item discussed, what, which was the discussion of an exploratory vote to see if staff are in favor of pursuing a second resolution of no confidence in the board. As of today, voting has opened up to staff to explore this topic. Once results are in from the voting, we will then determine the next step and whatever that might be. The remainder of the meeting was spent, spent bringing some fun and positivity. We were able to explore entries in our monthly caption this contest, which brought about some much needed laughter and wonderful smiles throughout staff. We were also able to share and celebrate some incredible stories and highlights on the amazing work that goes on at the Seabert building. The Seabert building is home to IT, the Sentinel, the Mail and Copy Center, and Fleet Services. I'm just gonna give you a little Reader's Digest version of what we shared no, at the meeting. Go ahead, um, sing, sing the praises. Okay, so the Sentinel, uh, which is our student newspaper and where former students such as Hannah Neff and uh, Jerry McRae have gone on to success and working for the Coeur d'Alene Press. The Sentinel was awarded the CMA Pinnacle Award for Best Two-Year Magazine, as well as Jeff Carr was awarded the CMA Distinguished Advisor Award. 
our ID, IT department uh, holds 33 members. While that might seem like a large group, compared to what they do for our institution, it's a huge task that they take on. They provide support to staff and uh, students throughout the main campus and all of our outreach, uh, outreach sites. IT manages and supports 2,100 computers, 750 phones, 160 servers, 280 wireless access points, and so much more. I don't have enough time to literally go on with everything that they do. This does not include the millions of emails, tens of thousands of Microsoft team chats, and let's not forget Zoom. There, did you know that there was over 20,000 Zoom meetings just this year alone? It's huge, it's a lot. So the work that this department does is amazing. When we say we couldn't do it without T, that is an understatement. We also have the mail and copy center. We have a, they have a mighty team of three employees, but operate as if they have 20. They make 45 mail stops per day, sometimes twice on main campus. They mail out hundreds of letters, books, process all the printing order requests and delivering supplies. They help keep us running. Finally, Fleet Services, a crew of three dedicated employees making sure NIC employees can safely get to and from buildings across campus to other outreach centers and even be able to participate safely in our fun events like local parades and festivals. We were able to celebrate and say we see you this past or just the other Friday on the 12th um, and we were able to stop by deliver some muffins and just share our gratitude and appreciation for all the work that uh, goes on in the Siebert Hall. Uh, we will be sharing the winner of our caption this contest as well as pictures from the we see you celebration um some of the staff members from that uh, hopefully we'll get it out in the nick now this week um that concludes my report this evening should mr wardinsky stand up and take a bow I, I do hear a lot of great things about ken and his gang from the it folks and boots on the ground back there gentlemen ken thank you for the fine work your people do um, any comments or questions or anything for Sarah? Mr. Chair? Trustee Wood. Well, Sarah, great to hear about all the awards. Well-deserved to everyone who received them. It's always a bright spot to hear that what's going on. But I, I can't gloss over the fact that the, the um, staff assembly may be taking a vote of no confidence in the board of trustees. Yes. At the last, uh, last meeting of this board, the faculty assembly basically made a statement of vote of no confidence of the trustees. Those are very serious things. I would imagine it has everything to do with governance. And um, I, I'm just gonna tell you my commitment, I take it seriously. And I just got berated by the board chair. And, um, but it, obviously there's more than just me concerned about behavior. So interesting to know, and we wait to hear what staff says. Absolutely. You mentioned the Sterling Silver Award. Now, yes. I think they get a picture of that in the Nick Now normally and get their award. And that comes with some- Some perks. Some yeah. perks, you some monetary. You get a parking spot, you get a hundred dollar, you get a check for a hundred bucks. You get, I think a $50 car to your favorite restaurant. Um, yeah. And you mentioned Jeff Carr and uh, I don't see him, but I know we've got something from him. Zoom. Oh, zooming in. Okay. I was going to say, um, I, I don't see him. I would make him stand up and ring a cow bell if <laughs> <laughs> he was here. So. <laughs> Very good. So we'll, hopefully we'll hear, have him take a, well, I was going to say have him take a bow, but there you go. we'll do it uh, virtually, I guess. Um, any more comments or questions? A lot of success out of Siebert Hall. Yes. All right. That looks like it. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. All right, we have the Senate, Jeff Carr, and he's zooming in, I understand. Uh, thank you, Chair Banducci, uh, fellow trustees. Can you hear me? Yes, and congratulations. Well, thank you very much, sir. Um, the Senate report is very brief. Uh, your meeting got pushed up due to the Thanksgiving holiday. Our meeting, however, kept its regular schedule. So the Senate has not met since uh, the last time I gave the board a report. So there is nothing new to report. Uh, do you have any questions for me? That's a short and succinct report. Uh, comments or questions for Jeff? Jeff, I don't see or hear any. Uh, thank you for your report. Thank you, sir. Have a good evening. All right, next on the agenda is the president's report, uh, Dr. Sabali. Thank you. Chair Banducci, trustees, 
the public that's here. I wanna start with thanking all board members for their support. Every single one of them individually has been supportive of me as I stepped into this role. And I can assure you all that they all care deeply for NIC. And I look forward to continuing to work with them and through the process of accreditation, which I will talk about a little bit later in my report. Um, last week was my first week as interim president, and it was a very busy week on campus. It started on Monday, where I got to attend the foundation scholarships, recipients, and alumni award dinner. Rail, congratulations on a great event. I did see Trustee McKenzie there in his role as a trustee too. Uh, trustee Lee is onto the foundation representing the board and thank you, um, Trustee McKenzie for making sure to attend as well. It was an amazing night and it was amazing to hear stories from two students about what their support of the foundation means to them and helping them attend and navigate, navigate college at NIC. It, it reminded me of when I was a student and sometimes car trouble and things like that that came up and the work of the foundation and the support of the foundation is second to none. And thank you, Ray L, for what you do. And thank you for the support you bring in your role. Three alumni were honored. R Randy Boswell, who's worked at NIC for 29 years, was the honorary alumni of the year. Rose Tedman was honored as the alumnus of the year. And Dr. Bryant was honored as the distinguished alumnus of the year. It was remarkable to hear the pride that they have in NIC. Rose promoted our art program so well and noted that she is honored that her son teaches here. And that is one of her greatest honors. Director Bryant talked about the wonderful influences that Coach Williams and Dean Bennett had on him, lasting impacts even 30, 40 years down the road. There were some athletic awards that were given out last week um, from the NWAC. It's with great pride that I get to announce to you all that Coach Ken Thompson, our men's soccer coach, and our women's soccer coach, Kelsey Parson, were both named East Region Coaches of the Year. The men's team had three selected student athletes to the East Region team, and the women had five, including the Women's East Region Player of the Year, Emily Stewart. On Thursday, NIC hosted the State Board of Education Executive Director, Matt Freeman, and two new board members, Kelly Roach and Sydney Sidaway. Our guests had a tour of the Parker Center where Doug Anderson and Chris Martin just beamed the entire time talking about the amazing 110,000 square foot facility and the support that NIC gets from industry and the foundation to give the students the most amazing experience. The dinner and updates about NIC were great learning experiences for the new State Board of Ed members. Members got to know our college, but what happened at the end of the evening is what touched me the most and gave me so much joy. After the dignitaries had left, Annie, who's our ASNIC president, and Ryan, an ASNIC senator, students who attended the dinner as ASNIC representatives, who helped give tours, they stayed behind after all the dignitaries had left, all of PC other than Rahel had left, and they cleaned up the tables for Chris Ross from Sodexo. They picked up all the plates, they dumped all the cups of water in a sink just because they wanted to help. They were in service to this institution and they did the little things far from the eyes of everyone else. I'm not sure they know, but that's, that's an example of what real leadership is. And it's a reminder to me that no job is too small or insignificant in service to NIC. And I hope to strive to live to that example every night and every day in my role here. I'm going to touch last on accreditation. And I had a conversation with Dr. Ramaswamy today, and he had a great quote, quote, accreditation allows us to reach greatness. It holds us accountable to students. He does not want to come in as the heavy carrying a big old stick branch. And that was a quote, and I, and I appreciated that. He's here to support us, and he's here to help us take care of our students and make sure we're taking care of our students. And Dr. Burns, I wanna thank you for providing the roadmap last month to items within the board's role as we focus together on our accreditation needs. I'm happy to report that we are moving in the right direction in some ways and that the board is making progress on the action plan provided. In regards to action step one, it, it has been met when I signed my contract as interim president and I'll work with Mark Lyons to make sure that the verbiage specific to action step one is placed in the permanent president's contract as well. 
Action step two involved the return of public comment to meetings and we had public comment today and I support com public comment being placed on each monthly board meeting agenda. And I will make sure to remind them that we need to have public comment. Action step three, the board has been respectful of my recommendations I made this past week and I hope they continue to demonstrate that and work together in public as well. Action step four, I've begun discussions with members of the board and individuals about areas that they think that they could use some training and how we can start doing it. Trustee McKenzie today met with Foundation Director Rayl Anderson and two foundation board members on how to grow in his leadership and support to serve the role of trustee liaison to the foundation. And potentially this is something that may come up for discussion just like a K-Tech report, a foundation report at board meetings um, was mentioned in that meeting. Actions seven through nine are the issues that revolve around the role of the board and its leadership. The board addressed its leadership roles and their duties at the meeting tonight and did make some changes to certain people in certain positions. They addressed what the roles mean and agreed to honor those roles and responsibilities and relationships with college leadership as well. Thank you for allowing me to give my report. I give the floor back to you. Are there any questions or comments or anything for Dr. Sabali? Mr. Chair. Trustee Howard. Dr. Sabali, um, I do wanna direct some comments to you. Um, you said that you've met with the trustees and you have the support of the trustees. I wanna reinforce what you said. I intend to support you. It's no secret that I did not vote for you. I was upset with the process. It was objectionable. It wasn't inclusive. It was the kind of thing I think that violated a lot of the concepts that this college stands for. In our discussions this morning, which was our first opportunity to meet, I am left with the impression that you are dedicated to moving forward and trying to do, make th do things better. I think I mentioned to you at, at the time, the future is yours to make because I think that this college expects from you inclusiveness. They expect you to reach out to them with regard to changes that may be made, suggestions that may be made, to get input from the faculty and the staff and the community, because this is a community college. And I think in my discussion with you, you have indicated to me that that will be your effort. The future will tell how effective you are on that. But I, um, I hold great promise, quite frankly, in the fact that you are gonna do the kinds of things that will include the faculty and staff and the community in significant decisions as you move forward. So I just wanted to publicly reinforce the fact that my job as trustee is to support you. You were hired as the, as the president. <clears throat> I am gonna support you, but I'm also gonna hold you um, accountable with regard to what I think are the proper roles. But thank you very much for the conversation this morning. For me, it was a positive move forward. Mr. Trustee Chair, Wood. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sabali, I don't need to repeat everything that Trustee Howard said. I would just uh, concur with, with all of it. I had an opportunity to meet with you today too for lunch. I appreciated an opportunity to get, get to know you, to um, put a face to the name and have some good conversation. And I, I just would echo that I look forward to a uh, real strong emphasis on participatory governance on campus. It's, it's very crucial to our success. So I support you and, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be here as we move forward to continue to do so. Thank you, trustees Howard and Wood. Anything else from anybody else? All right. Hearing no more comments, we will move on to the next item under, which is under unfinished business, be tab two, be the second reading action item, adoption of Head Start Policy Council bylaws, Beth Ann Fuller. And Beth Ann, last time I asked if we were gonna get the War and Peace version of the Reader's Digest, and you said Reader's Digest, so I'm suspecting Today might even be quicker. Cliff's notes, maybe? Even quicker. But February, hold on, because that's when we 
present our entire Head Start grant. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Chair Banducci and board members and Dr. Savali and guests, thank you for allowing me to come for the second reading of the Policy Council bylaws, which by order of the Head Start Act is something that the Board of Trustees has to approve in order to share governance with our parents and our community members that make up our Policy Council. So I stand for any questions you have about any changes that were proposed or any questions you have about that process. Mr. Chair, one moment, sir. Beth Ann, is there anything to note that's changed from when you spoke to us last or is everything identical no, as it was? It was just the same. Okay, thank you. Trustee Howard. Yes, I just wanted to make a motion that we uh, approve the attachment A, which is the Head Start Policy Council bylaws. I'll second that. All right, we have a motion on the floor. We have a second. Are there any comments or questions? And Trustee Howard, you have the first opportunity since it was your motion. I have no questions. Okay. Comments, anybody else? Chair, Chair Banducci? Yes, go ahead, Trustee Barnes. I had only one question, just out of curiosity. I noted that there was a change in the uh, quorum from a simple majority to one third. So out of curiosity, what is the total membership and what was the, the reasoning for changing that quorum threshold? So the, the makeup of the policy council depends on the size of the center. And so larger centers have two representatives and, and smaller centers, which could be a one classroom center in our rural areas have one policy council parent. We also have uh, board um, members that consist of community members that our policy council parents um, allow onto the board by voting them in if they have um, some, some great input for our program. So the third majority was just to make sure that we have a, a proper representation during that, those decision making and they felt that that was, was most appropriate. Uh, Follow-up, please. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. So I, I guess the question, the question was, what, what, what is the total number of the membership? And was, was there a problem getting a quorum when the, when the quorum was a threshold of, of a simple majority? Was that the reason that, there was, that uh, you had problems attaining a quorum and to conduct business? Um, yes, there at times there was a problem with a quorum. If people weren't able to make it, for an example, when we had um, inclement weather and things like that. So there have been times that there wasn't a quorum and they felt that having that, that third would, and the, if you wanna know the, the makeup of the entire group fluctuates, but right now we have three uh, community members and we have about um, with unseated positions right now as different centers vote uh, parents that can continue on. We have approximately 15 parent representatives. So that fluctuates from, from month to month. So currently right now, what would be the number of uh, members that would uh, constitute a one third quorum? Currently 18 seated members. Okay, great, thank you very much. You would need 18 or a third of the 18? A third of the 18. So six Yes. to have the quorum, okay. Michael, did that answer your question? Trustee Barnes. So eight, 18 uh, yes, total. Yes, thank you for clearing that further. You need six. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments? All right. We have a motion. We have a second. All those in favor of approving the motion, please say aye. 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 Uh, the motion carries five to zero. Thank you, Beth Ann. All right, next on the agenda is tab three. It's an action item. Approved presidential search firm and search parameters. 
Mr. Chair. Trustee Wood. At the last meeting, I made a motion to move forward with uh, ACCT. The reason I did so, I had read all of the proposals and the comparison was quite strong. For instance, with um, Greenwood and Asher, the minimum price is $60,000. With the Poly Group, the price is 52,000. ACCT is 37.5 plus travel expenses. And Gold Hill Associates is uh, 43.7 plus expenses. And then the late one we got today from RPA is $68,000, 500 plus expenses. The differences between their action times is not that significant, except that ACCT would uh, begin as soon as um, the end of November, maybe begin in December, and they would, the target goal to have a president start would be July 1st. We have a lot of, um, background with them. We've done numerous uh, consultants with them and I'm comfortable with them. They have the best proposal. And so I, again, would nominate ACCT to lead the presidential search. I would suggest that there's one different piece of information, although you did mention the addition of RPA Inc. that came in today around midday. I also believe there's been a letter from the poly group where they've made some adjustments potentially too for presidential search because of some other contracts that we've signed with them. Um, so there may be a, an additional data point there. Do, did someone down here say something? No, I, I have some before someone seconds it. I'd like more discussion. <clears throat> uh, Trust Trustee McKenzie. Well, I have a motion. <laughs> Don't we just second, whether the second then have discussion? What was that a motion? The motion was for ACCT. Well, then I'll just be amending a motion. Would you like? Let's... Okay. Trustee Wood made a motion. I'll second it. Trustee Howard has seconded it. Uh, Trustee McKenzie. Um, I feel like these quotes before us are doing two things. They're one, they're going against what people are saying about rushing the process for this upcoming summer. And two, uh, Oh, it was a, uh, we, we still have new bids that even showed up today that I personally haven't looked at those ones that came in today. So, um, but I, I'd say these bids or these quotes are uh, honestly even, I want, I want to go with one of these firms and I, I'm open to that. You know, it's a good idea. That's what we said we do, but I feel like the timeline um, needs to be hashed out more with these firms to get a, a, maybe even new, new proposals from them. And so I'd like to amend uh, the motion uh, in a, to basically to go get new quotes with new timelines to where has the, the full-time president starting, um, well, about July 1st, about 18 months from now. Um, and the reason why I say that is because I've been reading in, in, inside higher ed education articles, and there's a new trend among colleges where interim presidents last between one and three years. So I think it's, and there's, a, I think that's wise. Um, and I, I would like to see that for North Idaho College because changing a president right before a big accreditation report is due, is just, we have a lot of work to do in the next eight months. So um, yeah, so I, I amend the motion. Uh, Trustee uh, McKenzie. I I don't believe that would be an, an amendment to that motion. I think we'd have, to, if, if you want to do something different, you would just not vote for this motion at this time. So in other words, if you didn't want to choose ACCT right now, then you would just not vote for it. Then you would make a separate motion that would say, here's the timeline that I, I would like to see for stability, or I don't think the timing is is good and we need well, to extend it and do that like i said before like i tried to speak before someone could mention it but then it was silence before we're in the scenario w would any of the trustees be willing to back out so we can have a timeline of the discussion because that totally impacts uh the bids that are before us and which ones we choose well we can have some more discussion and then uh, quite frankly what we'd probably have to do is is have a vote and if they don't if there's not at least three votes for the acct not for the 
motion of, of selecting ACCT at this time, then it just won't, won't happen. So there will have to be a vote. So we can continue with the comment with that on the floor right now. Mr. Chair. Just a moment, I wanna give everybody else a chance to talk first. Uh, Trustee Barnes, did, did you have any comments or questions at this time? If you don't, that's uh, thank okay. You, Chair ben. Yeah, no, thank you, Chair Bantucci. Um, this is new, obviously, to to me as well, and I would I wonder if there is the opportunity to to interview uh, key representatives from each of these um, organizations um, in the process, so that we take our time in doing this. Um, so I, you know, I won't be voting for in in favor of ACCT at this time. I, I don't have anything against them. Um, but uh, so I would vote again. I will vote against it in favor of uh, maybe a motion to um, uh, begin a process of interviewing representatives from each of these firms. Yep. And I think everybody else has commented, but me. Yeah. No, I'm gonna, well, if I can clarify. More comments. I'm sorry, what's that? There's more comments. Mr. No, I no, I said that. I, what I said was everybody else has commented but me. So I'm going to I, say something. I haven't said anything. Sir, Second, I seconded the motion. Seconded the motion. Sure. I, I also have Dr. Sabali with his hand up. I'd like to go ahead. I'll defer to you. Sure. Okay. I also wanted to clarify, um, since we mentioned this, the Poly Group did write an email this week um, that because we signed two search contracts with them, they would do the um, presidential search at 50% of what that um, proposal said, so that you guys are aware of that. Thank you. Um, I want to speak in support of ACCT for the following reasons. I mean, cost is one thing, and obviously they're one of the most competitive costs, excuse me, fees. When you look at all the proposals, um, they also involve costs cost to this institution for publishing, uh, cost uh, with regard to travel of candidates and that sort of thing. So when you add the costs on which ACCT did, uh, they're still very competitive. Uh, in fact, is I think they're the lowest. But I don't think that's the most important aspect um, to um, utilizing ACCT. We have used them at least four times that I know of in the past two of those times I was uh, involved in. What is impressive about ACCT, and you, when you talk about it, it's Association of Community College Trustees. And when you think about that, it's all made up of trustees who are doing the same thing we're trying to do now, which is trying to find leadership. And they uh, have an intimate connection with colleges all around the country. Um, with regard to who may be available, um, what their qualifications are. And they have in the past been able to reach out to people and get uh, candidates to make application for us to review. They also have a review process that is very inclusive. Um, they encourage the development of a citizens committee. The last time that committee uh, was comprised of about 23 people. Uh, we went out and we, <clears throat> got candidates from certain categories within the community, business and industry, government, medicine, students, faculty and staff and parents, and asked that there be two or three members in each one of those categories. There may be more, obviously. It was a fairly large group. I think there was 23, 26 people, um, but it was a very active and involved group and it got the community involved in what, um, we know that they're interested in, and that is trying to help uh, make NIC a functional and a, and a successful college. Um, the whole process went well because it was an opportunity for them to sit down, go through. I think we had a total, <clears throat> excuse me, of something like 70 applications. There may have been a few more than that. They screened those applications, reduced the number down, and then finally we had interviews with a number and then finally that uh, number was uh, re reduced down to five or six um, uh, candidates who were referred on to the trustees for a decision. The process was very inclusive. 
it allowed uh, the way uh, ACCT um, organized it. Uh, they brought those candidates that made their shortlist on campus, had an opportunity for everybody to interview them. Um, so I, I am impressed with the process, quite frankly. I think it's important, particularly now, in order for us to be um, uh, very transparent and very inclusive, that we adopt um, a consultant that has a process that makes sure that it includes all the constituents in the community. ACCT has demonstrated uh, the procedures to do that. So I support them because of the process. Um, it's an additional benefit that uh, uh, they're also one of the most economical of the um, um, people who made it um, bids on this. Mr. Chair. <clears throat> My turn. I'm, I'm waiting to see if, if the envelope shows up for the honorarium. That was a, a nice endorsement for ACCT. Um, I'm, while I've been to several ACCT's conferences and we did use them for some training for us this past year, I'm not necessarily convinced that they're the best choice at this time. We've had five companies that have given us quotes and two companies that I happen to see rated very highly, AGB and RH Perry that have both declined to give us quotes. And in both cases, as it turns out, uh, getting further information, it's because they're both busy because they're both very good. And if you go on the website, RH Perry is extremely impressive. And if you, if you see the, what they've done. So there are a number of vendors that are quality. I would suggest to you that all of them are gonna use a similar model. In fact, if you look at the packages we got, they're all 20 to 30 pages. Um, and this is something that we'd already agreed to as a board. So for all the people that came up and publicly spoke and, and all the rest of that, understand that first off, Lita Burns will be on the search committee whenever we get there, whether she's retired or on staff or whatever, that was part of that. Uh, secondly, there will be, um, I'm sure there'll be some constituent groups uh, there will be um, community members. So it will be a, a significant search. Um, it'd be a national search. It, it will take time. Uh, I would suggest it's going to be a six, seven, eight month search. And um, so for those that were concerned that we're not going to do a real search with a real company, uh, yes, we are, and, and we will. So hopefully that alleviates your concerns. Uh, and that has been the in int intention all along. And, and we've agreed to, to that and, and, and some of the aspects of that already. Uh, and it will take time to assemble the different groups, constituent, community, whatever. And there's a, obviously some processes through that. I, th I think the cart's a little before the horse right at the moment though. We're gonna do a search. I, I think one of the questions is, A, who does it? And Trustee Barnes touched on something. Uh, I personally, uh, either the board or if we have a couple of representatives that are gonna be on the search committee, I think the board, uh, those representatives need to interview the companies and talk to them about how they're gonna do the search, who's gonna do search, who's gonna be uh, on their search committee and, and get a little better answer, I think, we're falling into, oh, we know ACCT, we can spell it, it's four letters, it's easy, I like the price point, but ACCT is not, in the eyes of some, is not where it was even just a few years ago, and they've had a change of, of leadership and even the person that oversees that process. Um, and I look at some of the others, and, and I've made some calls and talked to folks that, that know. And it's interesting as they rank ordered the four that we had and gave me numerical values on a one to 10, and then a couple of the ones that we haven't gotten quotes from, and now the new one, we did get a quote. And, and I'm not gonna publicly say those numbers because I don't wanna offend any of the companies that have given us quotes, but um, I, I, think, I, I think we can uh, continue to look and I think we can make sure we, we, we get what we feel is gonna be the best fit for us. So that's one issue is, is who we choose and how we go through the process of selecting them. So tonight, I'm not, I'm not prepared to select a company at all tonight, but I think we have a bigger issue, honestly. And I think this is the timing of it. We, um, we're talking about, we're gonna do this process and we've got the, 
the 10 items on the list and everything's gonna be focused to try to prepare this report that's gonna go be submitted prior to one August, which means we're gonna to have to really have that thing finalized probably by the latter part of June to make sure that we get it uh, just the way we want it in July and submit it. So every I dotted and T crossed. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna tell the, we're gonna tell the folks at the accreditation that we think we're doing great. That's what I'm anticipating. We're gonna tell them we think we're doing really good. We have a great relationship between senior management and the board. We're working together, we're communicating. Uh, hopefully the constituents have full faith and confidence in the senior leadership and we have full faith and confidence in them and they're doing the job and, and everything's great. And then we're gonna say, after we've just had a turnover of, of uh, some vice presidents, some deans, I'm not sure how this is all gonna play out how this is all gonna look and we're good. We're gonna say, oh, now we're gonna change the most important thing, which is the president. And we're gonna bring someone in that we've not worked with, we have no relationship with, we don't know. And we just gave you the report that said, hey, we're in great shape, but now we're just gonna change the very thing at the top. And to me, that makes no sense um, because anything could happen at that point. Um, and you have an unknown quantity that nobody will have worked with that you're hoping it goes well, but there's no history there. So while I'm in favor of this national search, I'm in favor of the constituent groups being engaged, I'm in favor of the community being engaged, and for us to run a full thing, I don't agree with the timing. And quite frankly, I'd like to spend the next eight months getting our ducks in a row, putting together that report and looking as shiny as possible give Dr. Sabali and his team one year to make us look stable and where anybody would wanna apply here. Right now, I keep hearing, we're going too fast, we're going too slow. Nobody wants to apply here. Everybody wants to come here, no, nobody does. Some of the companies don't wanna work with us. I, we're in such a state of flux and such a strange place right now. I think the best thing that can happen to this campus is, is a period of stability and, and just settle in and and just do great for our students. And then I think we're gonna become that much more attractive. And I think it, it'll be a better time to do it. So that's my thinking is that I'm not prepared to vote for any uh, search right now. We can talk about what it looks like when we get there. I have no problem with that. I think we've done that. Uh, I think the timing's the issue. And I think right now we couldn't pick the worst timing to do this with everything that's happening. And it's just a confluence of events. Mr. Chair. So that's my comment. It, Mr. Chair, the president wants to speak. President, Dr. Sabali. I'll let um, Trustee Howard go first. All right. I'll return the floor. Trustee Howard. Thank you. Um, quite frankly, I find a little incredulous your comments about timing because there was a rush to terminate um, our last president. You couldn't wait to do it, had to happen quickly. We, we had special meetings and executive sessions trying to get it done. And then um, once we, uh, once you terminated that president, we had, we needed an interim president and we had Lita Burns, Dr. Lita Burns. I would be an acting president. Acting and president, I'm guessing thank you. Don't you. Thank you. Expect me to respond to your comments about the rush of the last president or his situation. Would you let me finish my comments? I didn't interrupt you. I'm just hoping you not asking. Thank you. So Dr. Burns agreed, quite frankly, to continue on as president, but you wouldn't even address that issue. Um, so there was a rush to get to a different interim president. And we had that rush and we went to executive session. We didn't even interview the applicants and we had very qualified applicants who were senior vice presidents here didn't even get a consideration because there was a rush to get um, uh, an interim president. And now that we're there, everything wants to slow down. You want to slow everything down. And I think you want to slow everything down because you want to control the outcome. You don't want the outcome to be as a result of a new president who is selected by the public, not by you and not by the other two trustees. You want to see uh, an, an activity over the next eight, nine, 10 months, a year, three years, whatever it is, 
quite frankly, that you're in control of. I object to that. I truly object to that. Mr. And, Chair. And okay. I'm not finished yet, please. Sure. I think that what we have to do is regain the confidence of the public and we have to move forward with getting a permanent president so we do not have to go through another trauma of uh, some kind of changes that are gonna take place in the future. Traditionally, changes and selections of president take place within a certain time frame. That time frame is dictated by usually those applicants have jobs, they have commitments to other colleges, and so they're not gonna leave mid-year. They'll start looking in January and the selection will be made by July. It's a long-term process and it's very involved. So to suggest that it's a rush is a mischaracterization, quite frankly, of what is done across the country. The only slowness that you're encouraging is you wanna have more control over the outcome. You know, it's ironic that you would say that because I'm proposing a year from now, which would put us on the same timeline for your January through July. And, and at the end of the day, Ken, and you know this better. So what you just said was very disingenuous. I'm disappointed in you. You've done this a lot lately. Who are the five people at the end that vote to hire the president? It's five trustees. We get the input from the community. We get the input from the constituents. When I was here on the last one, we had a box and we had the last ones that came to us, the finalists, and we went to dinner with each of them. And then we talked about them and we interviewed them and we did all that. But at the end of the day, there was five people, there was five votes. And so what you just said almost makes no sense. At the end of the day in July, it'll be the five of us with Trustee McKenzie, myself and Trustee Barnes, you and Trustee Wood. So you feel good with that five, me delaying it won't hurt you or change it that I can tell as far as how you might think the votes come out. Yeah. So, so I, I don't understand where you're going with that. The composition of this board isn't going to change in six months. It might change in a year or a year and a half. Very well could. Mr. Chair. So, so I, I, I'm, not going, I'm not sure you go with, the, with that about the vote. It makes no sense to me. Mr. Chair. Trustee Wood. This was my original motion and it's been completely and totally hijacked by yourself, Trustee McKenzie, Trustee Barnes, and we're now seeing a clear agenda that we, we didn't understand before. And I'm not done and I'm going to speak. You spoke for about 10 minutes Go ahead. by hijacking the idea that we would choose a search firm tonight. And then you took a total different direction that you wouldn't even respect this community, respect this campus that expects a legitimate search process. Instead, the clear agenda is for the three of you to delay as long as you possibly can. Mr. Sabali is an interim. That's what we said to the community. They know well he's serving in an interim process. In eight months, whatever firm we would go with, we would have a permanent president. Eight months is more than enough time to do the work it takes to find a finalist. Maybe it will even be him if he chooses to apply. However, what you're doing, first of all, you launched into trustee Howard's opinion on ACCT, which was so completely disrespectful toward him and towards ACCT. And then you take liberty as chair. You know, the chairman generally listens to the board. They're the last to speak, but that's never been your style. So what you have done tonight, clearly the three of you have collaborated once again, you're attempting to delay the uh, search for a new president. You think this community is gonna stand for that, Todd? Do you really believe that? You think you're not gonna be accountable? Not only that, it's quite clear in the governance, quite clear through the process we're going through with accreditation right now, you think that's not going to be an issue? It's outrageous what you're trying. If you don't like ACCT, offer up one of these others, but you have, absolutely taken away any credibility you have by trying to delay this by, what did you say, 18 months, three years? That's just completely outrageous and you know it. It is a control thing with you. Trustee Howard was spot on. You have failed this community and once again in your role as board chair. I call for the question on promotion. I, I was gonna say something, I'll just... I'll email you the Inside Higher Education article, Christy, where 
it shows the major trend. So we would definitely be in with good company. And also it seems like by not going with ACCT right now, it seems like you're trying to diminish our respect for ACCT, which is in no ways correlated. So. Did you I hear the chair? Actually, I was pretty careful not to disparage any of the no, you different companies. No. And I, with regards to accreditation, the board has gone through a lot of training this past year and continues to do so. And I was just want to publicly state my appreciation of ACCT. I've really enjoyed it early June. Yeah, Mary and Ken did a great job with the training that we had. Mr. Chairman, if I could just make one quick point. Yes. I'd like to remind the board that they did make a, a commitment earlier uh, this this uh, fall to go through the process, and that was included in in uh, uh, acting President Burns's contract. Yes, we're definitely still committed to doing that. I, I think I think Vice President uh, Burns has a comment on that. Dr. Burns. Thank you, Tristan Anducci, and I do appreciate you recognizing um, the process which was referred to in the resolution that you all signed, signed in regards to my becoming the acting chair. But I do want to point out that the first statement says the board will immediately request NIC to engage in a search process for a new president, which, will, which search process uh, will be consistent with the past practices of presidential searches and then included the bullet points. So it did say immediately engage, and that was what you all signed off on. We, and that's a written contract, Mr. Chair. I understand. We are still fulfilling that, Christy. And you well, just, you know what? That'll be up for interpretation, won't it, Greg? It's outrageous. What hold, the on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No. The crosstalk like that is inappropriate from to trustee to trustee. So if you would refrain from that, I'd appreciate it. We have a tendency to break down on, on all decorum here at times and process. So please, please direct through the chair. Mr. Chair, call for the question again. Okay. I have Trustee Howard has called for the question. The motion was to accept ACCT as the firm to do the search. The motion was seconded. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. 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 Chair votes nay. Motion is defeated three to two. Mr. Chair, I make a motion to accept Poly Group as a search vendor. I have a motion on the floor. Second. Motion has been seconded. Comments or questions? Uh, Trustee Wood, you made the motion to get first crack. Yes. If, uh, if the three of you don't want to use ACCT, as I said before, there's other firms to choose from. What's important is we honor our commitment to this community, to this college, to a written legal contract, and we move forward tonight with a search firm. Eight months is more than enough time to find a quality president. And as I said, maybe it's even Dr. Savali. He may determine whether he wants to apply, but we have a commitment to follow through. So we need to choose a search firm tonight. I have a statement. Trustee McKenzie. As you said yourself, it's open to interpretation. We are committed to starting that process and fulfilling obligations, but z zero questions of this board in obtaining these bids in front of us was asked of this board in what we wanted for that search ourselves. So I call the question, we think we've all said enough in the prior one. Well, I have a comment, I might. Trustee Howard. I find it ironic that you wanna interview the search consultants and we never got a chance to interview the uh, applicants for the interim president. I find we it. never got a chance in order to um, have some opportunity to make a selection between some very 
uh, qualified candidates. Now what you wanna do is even though you wouldn't uh, consent to doing interviews of the potential uh, applicants for president or the applicants, you wanna take time to interview consultants. They've given us detailed uh, um, proposals. Um, the proposals outline their procedures. Uh, quite frankly, some of them are better than others, but you're not gonna get any more information out of them. Uh, and you're just trying to delay the process. It's pretty transparent. You know, if you don't want to make the decision tonight, stop trying to fool everybody and just say, make a motion. We're not going to decide and go ahead and the three of you pass it. Let's stop the gamesmanship. Well, I'm trying to make a motion for the timing of the search related to these things, but people keep beating me. Dr. Sabal, I wish to no matter what you guys decide tonight, I think it's important for this community that we make some progress on this tonight and at least work towards naming who our co-chairs are going to be. If you intend to interview or whatever else you guys intend to do, that we at least um, select our trustee members that are going to be on this committee. Mr. Chair. Trustee Wood. Hmm. What, what we yeah, okay. Again, again, I would encourage the board. There's been critical mistakes made in the past year. We don't have to make another one. This would be critical. The community will not forgive us. The college campus will not forgive us. I, can't, I just can't imagine why you would put us in the crosshairs again. This is on the agenda for the second time. We have had ample time to review all the consultants and their proposals. They're very similar, except for price, time frame similar. We have to make a decision on a search firm tonight and move forward with the search for the permanent president. I make a motion to amend Christie's motion for Poly Group that we name the two uh, trustees who are going to be on the search committee and the um, two of them interview the uh, applicant or the, the, the company. Yeah, Trustee McKenzie, that would um, that would be a separate motion. Uh, that would not be an amendment. Um, it substantially is is a different motion. Um, an amendment would be to name a uh, a different firm or to have. Something else, but what you uh, what you're doing is is okay. different enough. That's a different should be a different motion. I call the question. All right, uh, Trustee Howard has called the question. We, we have a motion on the floor to accept the Poly Group for the search, and we have a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. 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 Board chair says nay. Chair, I wish to be recognized. Trustee McKenzie. I make the motion that we name um, well, I'll go for uh, Chair Banducci. And um, does anyone want to raise their hand to be on the committee before I name them? Or... Okay, I'll name myself. I don't see anyone. Uh, myself to be on the search committee and we interview these applicants. Uh, or just to be start, st I'll just start there, to be on the search committee and then I'll make a follow on motion after that. You want me to restate it? No, I, well, I'm not sure. I'm watching Mr. Lyons right. It's a uh, search parameters. I see it under search parameters. Mr. Chairman, what I have is a motion that was made by Trustee McKenzie. The motion is to name Trustees Manducci and Trustee McKenzie to be on the search committee. That's what I have. Okay. 
and then I'll just declare for conversation's sake while I'm looking for a second. Uh, I would make a follow on motion that uh, the search committee comprised with Dr. Lita Burns uh, starts making a plan interviewing the uh, applicants that we have for the search process and start working with Dr. Sabali, of course, as well, and start making a plan uh, for the search process. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, that would be a completely separate motion. Let's take them one at a time. Yeah. I'm just... and, and let me also add that, that once the process begins, I don't think it needs to be directed by motion. So we have a pending motion to name trustees Banducci and McKenzie uh, at, to be on the search committee. That's a motion. Can I get a second from anyone? That second would open discussion. And I know, I, I was just thinking about that. All right, I will second it just to open discussion. Mr. Chair, discussion. Yes, Trustee Wood. In the past, I have suggested to this board that to ensure a fair process perceived by both on campus and in the community, that Trustee Howard and yourself serve as co-chairs on, on the committee. I don't believe that you're going to find any confidence in yourself and the combination of yourself and Trustee McKenzie serving. All it's going to do is add fuel to the fire, once again, that we're already dealing with tonight, that there's a clear agenda. Trustee Howard has the experience that we need to serve in that manner, and he would do a good job and so I absolutely will not support this motion. Trustee Bandigi. Yes, Trustee Barnes. I was going to uh, suggest also that it be uh, Ken Howard and yourself, um, Trustee Banducci, Chairman Banducci, to be the co-chairs that I have a very high regard for. Um, uh, Trustee Howard's um, experience and opinions, and I'm I'm very well disposed to to favor his his assessment even of ACCT. Um, so I would favor more having a the, the two co-chairs uh, do a do an a, a review of these and maybe come up with two that rise to the top, just so that we have. Um, a better understanding of um, what other uh, firms might, uh, um, how they might address some of our unique situations in the search, rather than just um, going with the ACCT um, because we've used them before. Not that I'm opposed to using them because we used them before, but uh, as opposed to just being the, the lowest bid and we've used them before. So I would uh, support the, uh, Trustee um, Howard and Trustee Bentucci as co-chairs. Mr. Chair, may I address? Sure, Trustee McKenzie. Trustee Barnes, I hear what you had to say and I honestly can understand that viewpoint. And it's, there's, there's val, there's, it's a good, it's, it's good. But I also would like to point out that Trustee Howard and, and honest um, yourself have said since May to be working on the board conduct policy and due to scheduling commitments and load levels that it hasn't happened. And even with the treasurer appointments tonight with the, I, I don't know why that's go, wasn't accepted. And I just see, I haven't seen a demonstration of time availability um, to dedicate towards a presidential shirt search. It's gonna be quite involved. And, and with regards to Chair Benducci and, and myself being on it, it's gonna be a committee 
that is diversely representative amongst the community and will just be, you know, a vote on that committee. So that is going to guide this whole open, inclusive process. So I feel also one more statement that Trustee Howard, how many presidential searches have you been on? At least one, maybe two. Do you remember? I remember. You're not saying that. I don't mean to interrogate. Yes, forgive me. And uh, I just feel it may be time to let somebody else uh, be on the search committee. And the reason why I chose uh, Chair Banducci as he is the chair of the board, and I, I see that appropriate, and I would like the opportunity to uh, contribute the time, as I feel like I put in this past year, um, to dedicate it to this new endeavor. Thank you for the consideration. Trustee Howard. Well, the only oh, comment oh, I want to give me just say, oh, I'm, ad I'm addressing you, sir. Sure. Just for a moment. And it, yeah, you can comment. What I was going to say is, contrary to popular belief, I, I, I would reluctantly do this because it is going to be a tremendous time sink. And between my business and my military commitment, it's a challenge for me with everything else that's going on to try to have a life. Uh, I guess I pose the question to you because uh, there seems to be some concern. Is, is this a, an endeavor that A, you would be willing to take on and B, do you feel that you have the time and ability to do it, sir? Well, I'm about 90% retired. So do I have the time? Yes. Do I have the willingness to do it? I'm continuing as a trustee because I feel I have an obligation to this institution. This is one of the most critical uh, activities that we can take on, which is selecting a new president. So yes, I'd be willing to spend whatever time is necessary in order to perform the duties of finding a new president. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, but there's a pending motion when you're dealing with it. I, I, yes, sir, I, I'm aware of that. I was just looking at Mr. Lyons. For what? <laughs> because we have the uh, motion and the second. Uh, Trustee McKenzie made a motion. Yes. And I seconded it uh, to allow discussion. So we need to vote on it. We do need to vote on it. Yes, sir. I was circling back to that. Later in the agenda when Trustee Barnes talks about some of his stuff. So I'll come around full circle. All right, we have a motion on the floor. We have a second. Um, all those in favor, of, well, let me repeat the motion. The motion right now is to create a two, two members of our board of trustees to be co-chairs on the search committee. Right now, it has been motioned for myself and Trustee McKenzie to be those two members. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. 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 The motion is defeated. Mr. Are, Chair. Are yeah. there any other motions? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd make a motion. We're gonna get back to this search, but for the two trustees to serve as co-chairs on the search committee and under discussion, I'm gonna go into what that means, would be yourself and Trustee Howard. All right, I have a Second. motion on the floor. I have a motion from Trustee Wood. I have a second from Trustee Barnes. Mr. Chair, Comments and questions and Trustee Wood, you made the motion, you get first crack. Thank you. I think there's probably some misunderstanding about what the role is of the co-chairs of a committee. They're essentially there to uh, work well with the committee. They're not there to guide the committee to come to any kind of conclusion. 
They don't have any influence over the committee. They're simply there to help co-chair the process. And so um, it's really important that that's understood that whether you think it's uh, your favorite trustees or your least favorite trustees, they have no more um, influence over the committee than anyone else. And so they're simply there to guide the process. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I would re release it back to other comment. All right, thank you. And if I may editorialize for just a moment, and for those that have been on prior searches, correct me if I misstate, but as I recall the last one, we went through this process and I alluded to it earlier, where the constituent group, the community group, all the folks, the search um, organization, distilled it down to a handful of candidates, finalists. And then that's when the five trustees did their interviews and had some, um, some social time with them and got to know them better and speak with them. And then the five trustees uh, then uh, made the choice to who to select. Uh, that sound about right? Uh, uh, let me just add to that. There was a part of that process where when the citizens committee had reduced the number down to less than a half dozen, I think, they were, they were invited on campus so that uh, they could be interviewed by faculty and staff. They made presentations to faculty and staff. That's and correct. then there was a further reduction after the constituents on the college campus and in the community had an opportunity to interview and uh, talk to those folks. So the final discussion, you're absolutely right, is made by the trustees from a, a, um, a group of probably no less than three and no more than five. I think we had five last time, if I remember correctly, five finalists. But you're right, I, I did. I, I kind of skipped over part of it, but there were some open forums, I think we called them at the time here, kind of all comers. All right, um, I have a motion. I have a second. Any additional comments or questions? Trustee Barnes, can you still hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Anything else from anybody? All right, all those in favor of the motion? Right, one more thing to say. Okay. Uh, tr Trustee McKenzie. Well, I don't think there's any hope of getting me on the search committee. I think that's best for NIC and I'm allowed to vote that way. I would just say, I feel like people have even implied in this conversation that some trustees have ulterior motives and pre-planned. And that is so insulting to say the least. So. And again, it's the same trustees at the end doing the voting, so. Um, Mr. Chairman, the motion on the floor is to have trustees Banducci and trustees Howard to be on the presidential search committees as co-chairs. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Nay. Uh, the motion carries. Mr. Chair. Trustee Wood. Like to get back to picking the presidential search firm. Actually, I had a follow on motion. Well, no, you don't. There's no such thing as a follow on motion. I've already stated my intent that I was going to make a second one after we figure out who gets on the search committee. It's not technically a follow on motion per se, but he did indicate he would like to make a motion. Uh, I would defer to Trustee McKenzie. Uh, Trustee Wood, you, you've had the opportunity to make a few motions. I'm going to defer to him. It's 8.25. I would like to call a 10-minute recess at this time just to allow everybody to catch their breath, get a drink of water. Thank you very much.
the world is full of pleasant people. All right, we are back in session after a short recess. We are still working under unfinished business, tab number three. Do I have any other comments or questions or motions? Trustee Barnes, can you hear us okay? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, just wanna make sure we had you uh, still online. The world of Zoom. Dr. Sabali. Um, I'd like to make the comment that if we're not ready to make a decision tonight, that we stop voting down vendors in open session because that's disrespectful to their propositions and may lead to the price rising here in the future with them. So, um, that just a recommendation there. That's probably a very sage, Mr. Chair. astute observation and recommendation. Trustee Howard. Um, there seems to be some concern about the timing. Um, I think it's ludicrous, but nonetheless, I'll acknowledge that there's a concern about it. But we could we can get a search firm tonight and tell them when to start. Tell them to start in January. Tell them to start whatever. But to not to not go through, use the information that we have in front of us, select a firm uh, so that at least what we can go through, if there was a suggestion that we interview these firms, um, uh, I don't think that's gonna change anything, but I would like to see us select the firm and, um, and then go ahead and give them a timetable when we wanna start. Mr. Chair. Trustee Wood. I agree with Trustee Howard. I think that if, if we leave here tonight, we do not select a search firm. We have failed the community and we have failed the college. We've had ample time to study these proposals and pick one. Whether they don't start until January or February, I suppose is negotiable. I, I agree that it's ludicrous, but it's negotiable. I, I think that you also have to understand we did sign a contract with Vice President Burns and in no world does immediate mean 18 months, six months, anything of the kind. I, I, it's almost, there's not even the least bit guessing game going on here, what's actually going on here. And so I, I can't imagine again why you would put us in the crosshairs. And that would be the three of you that have talked about delaying this. Why you would upset the community like this. You don't have a valid reason except for trying to control the process to delay it as long as you possibly can. That's obvious. And I think it's you're, you're doing nothing but damage. We need to move forward in a positive way. Select a search firm. Can I say something, Chair? Trustee McKenzie. Here's an article for anyone who wants to walk out of it. I'm getting eight more copies coming this way. Thank you, Dr. Graydon Stanley for helping me with that. But I just want to give you all a summary. It's by Emma Whitford, Emma Whitford on Inside Higher Education. It's titled Temporary President's Long-Term Benefits of June of this year, in fact. And here's a short summary for you all. As corporate America begins embracing multi-year interim executives, so does higher education. So, so was that the plan all along? The plan all along, Christy, is getting developed in this board meeting that you keep insinuating that we have a plan walking into this. If we had a plan walking into this, it'd be vote, vote, done. I don't think you have the courage. Wow, that's quite a statement. Okay, um, let's let's stop the crosstalk if we could, please. And, and, and a little just common courtesy would be appreciated. The, the accusations and the insinuations 
Mr. Are, Chair, you yourself the, have made accusations, so you really don't get to take the high road. We back ours up with facts, though, Christy. Now, hold on, hold on. Back. Let's not do that. And uh, thank you for interrupting me. I didn't get to finish my thought. Mm -hmm. Prove my point. All right. I make the motion that we postpone making a decision um, uh, for an executive uh, presidential search, so selecting a, a firm for presidential search tonight. We've already shot down two. And um, if maybe we should even, uh, in, just in discussion, um, um, decide tonight if we're going to interview them or not. That seems wise. But it just seems tonight. Um, and when it comes to the immediate, Christy, I just one more thing. We said we'd make an immediate interim president, and yet it took us how many weeks? It took so many weeks. And then even when we designated an interim president, we it was again delayed two weeks. And even when the president was freed on Monday from his responsibilities, so yes, we do are fully committed to starting an inclusive presidential search firm tonight. And we're figuring out what that looks like right now in front of everyone in an open meeting. Point of inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Trustee Barnes, please. Before I make my next statement, is there a motion on the table right now that has to be disposed of? No, I never finished. There, no, sir, there is not. There is not a motion pending. I move to table this to a special session before the end of the year. Okay. I have a motion. I'll second that. I have a question. I have a second. Uh, Trustee Howard. Um, point of inquiry, point of, point of order. I don't believe there's discussion on a move to table. Well, I, that could be correct. Um, I, I don't have a parliamentarian. I, yeah, I don't think that's true, but uh, I'm happy to min minimize my my point was when you said table it before the end of the year, I think it'd be more effective if we had a specific date. Yes, sir, I would agree. The challenge of that is calendars and normally Shannon. It's be before a certain date. Oh, I, I see. Before December 31st. End of the year. It's his motion. I believe that was part of my motion. Okay, Trustee Barnes, would you mind re saying your motion again, please? Move to place on the table the selection of the search firm to a special session to be conducted prior to the end of 2021. Okay. Yeah, I have a second from Trustee McKenzie. But yes, you do. If that was a question. And I don't, we had one question or comment from Trustee Howard. I'm not sure. It was more a point of order. Yeah. I, Call the question. Okay. Um, Okay, um, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Aye, Mr. Chair, I'm going to support this in the interest of getting this done before the end of the year. So aye. Okay. All those opposed say nay. Nay. All right, the motion carries.
Uh, Mr. Chair, clarification. Just, just, just a moment, Trustee Will. I'm, I'm talking to Mr. Long. Okay. Just, just a moment, please. You know, one of the things in the future, this is an opportune time. In the old days, we used to be on that side of the room and we were kind of in a bit of a semicircle and I could see the wings easier. And we've changed the, the formation here a little bit. And quite frankly, it is a challenge even just to see down the row. And, and Christy, I'm not trying to ignore you. Half time, I just can't see you. You're behind somebody. Same as Greg is uh, on the other side of the farm too. So I don't know if there's a way to do it, at least for me to be able to see or for us to see each other, or we can kind of maybe there'd be less chances to interrupt each other or be aware of others trying to, you know, engage. I don't know what we can do with that, but just something to think about because we, 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 we've got a different setup than we used to have back in the old days. And it was a little more conducive, I think, to the visual sight lines and, and communicating with each other because it, it is a challenge. And I'm not trying to ever not see somebody that wants to talk. It's just sometimes there's lots going on. It's harder. And, and the distance is bigger. We're, we, it, the, the dynamic has changed. That's all. So, so something to think about. All right, uh, new business action. Accept NIC financial audit for year ending June 30, 2021. Uh, Chris Martin and Barry Weber. Chair Banucci, members of the board, it is uh, my great pleasure this evening to come before you and ask for the acceptance of the FY21 financial audit. As the board is aware, we have to have an external audit and that audit is conducted each year by Ide Bailey currently. Uh, Barry Weber is senior audit manager with Ide Bailey and we'll be here just to uh, share a couple of brief points on the audit. And Chris, if I may take a moment, just for everybody to know the board of trustees, uh, at least myself and trustee Wood, along with um, Dr. Sabali, uh, with uh, Ms. Garcia, we've all been part of the audit briefings prior to this and have seen this and there's been discussion. So this isn't something that's brand new just being thrown at us. We have had the opportunity to review this and see this, and and uh, Christius Treasury Secretary, Secretary Treasurer, and myself as board chair were, were part of those meetings also. And Barry was very patient the other day to make two presentations, so thank you. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair Banducci and uh, Trustees. I'll uh, I'll try and be brief. Uh, respect everyone's time uh, tonight. One thing I did want to note um, as I kind of lead into this, we do uh, analysis of the related entities of the college. Um, and part of that analysis involves a lot of GASB rules and relationships between the entities. Uh, the three to be aware of for the college is going to be the Booster Club, the Foundation, and the Dormitory Housing Commission. And they're all treated differently. The Booster Club are not included in these financials. The Dormitory Housing Commission is consolidated within these financials, and then the foundation is presented separately within here. So you'll see specific pages that show the foundation number. So I just wanted to point that out before we uh, touch on a couple items related to the audit, and then just a couple of financial highlights. Uh, as once the audit is issued, uh, you'll get what's called a letter to governance. It's a 260 letter. It's effectively our letter that would indicate any issues we had with the audit, any findings, any uh, adjustments we had, disagreements with management, those kind of items. Uh, happy to say the letter this year will be completely clean. Uh, it's been clean every year that I've been here, uh, and this is actually the seventh year that I've been involved in the audit. On page two of the financials, you'll see our opinion uh, it's about three pages. This is really the only portion of the financials that's ours. And we have what's called an unmodified or clean opinion. So it says that these financial statements are materially correct. A couple notes on the financials themselves. The statement of net position is going to be on page 14. That's your balance sheet, if you will. Big change this year is the increase of about 9.4 million of assets. So there was a pretty significant increase in overall assets at the college. Uh, there's also, I like to point out, uh, there's a net pension, OPEB, other, other post-employment benefits. 
liability of about 7.6 million on these financial statements. And that was a change about five years ago that the GASB made where they forced that liability down from the state level to each individual organization. And so when you look at that, you'll see a very large liability. It's not what you would think of as a true liability. You're not gonna get a bill for $7.6 million. You're gonna to continue to pay into the pension system, but it is you know, put on your books by GASB. It's an accounting rule. It does kind of overstate those liabilities a little little bit. So you're going to see 7.6 million of liabilities that aren't really a true liability and upcoming payment from the college. Uh, the other thing I'll point out at the bottom of page 14 there is net position, and that's going to be your equity, your net worth from a book accounting standpoint, $96.6 million. Uh, that's again, understated by about 7.6 million because of that pension liability. So adjusting for the pension liability, you're looking at north of 103 million in equity net worth of the, the college as a whole, assets, assets exceeding liabilities. So from a financial position, very, very, very strong. Uh, I work with about 15 educational institutions, charter schools, community colleges, large universities. Uh, this has consistently been one of the strongest from a uh, financial standpoint. So over 103 million in net position and 22.7 in unrestricted net position. That's gonna be the free funds that we can use to pay payroll, make improvements, you know, kind of use for our bills. So again, that's very strong. A lot of times I'll see that as a negative number with a lot of the institutions I work with um, because they do have so much invested in property equipment, those kind of things. Page 16, statement of revenues and expenses, your profit and loss, if you will. Uh, the big piece I'll highlight there is net income before contributions of 6.3 million in 2021 and 2.6 million in 2020. So very strong last two years. 2020 also had about an $8 million capital contribution um, that was from last year's audit. So what you'll see in the, the quote unquote net income is very, very strong net income the last two years, 6.3 million and over 10 million in 2020. The one thing I do want to note on there is this is largely due to COVID funds. So you're going to look at, you know, 5 million of COVID funds this year, over a million last year. There's a huge influx of that net income that's going to be a result of those funds. So that, that those results aren't necessarily going to recur moving forward. Even subtracting the COVID funds, you're still looking at two, two and a half million of bottom line at the school every year. The next 60 pages or so is a lot of accounting policy, a lot of footnotes kind of disclosing uh, various pension liabilities, actuarial data, all those kind of things. If you have any questions on those, feel free to send them my way. I'm happy to address them. But I will go ahead and direct you to actually the last two pages of the financials, page 75. And this is where our single audit section is. This is where we audit the schedule of expenditures of federal awards. So all the federal funds that were spent, COVID relief, student financial aid, all of those, we audit that schedule. The programs that we looked at this year, we're gonna be the HERF funds, the Higher Education Emergency Relief, that's the COVID, Coronavirus Relief, another source of COVID, and then Head Start. Those are the three programs that we audit as part of our single audit this year. Uh, the one thing I will note is on page 75 and 76, we did have two deficiencies this year. Those are pretty rare. Uh, we haven't had one since 2018. And the two that I'll kind of lay out for you, um, we're seeing a lot. They're relating to the higher education emergency relief funds, the COVID funds, and they're very, very minor. They are what we consider the lowest threshold that we actually still have to report to you. Uh, and those two pieces are, one was the timing of the required COVID relief reports. And this was kind of a moving target. They released the requirements for HERF as a, as a whole in December of 2020. So about seven months after we received the funds. Um, in terms of the reporting, it was a 30 day report period and then they changed it to a 45 day report period and then they changed it to a quarterly report period and then they pushed back one of the quarters. So it was a real moving target. So there were a handful of reports that were posted late. All the information is there now, it's correct there now. So there's no compliance issues, but from a timing aspect, we're required to report that they were a little late. The other ones related to a process called suspension debarment. 
And that's where there's a list on the government website that would list any companies that are suspended or debarred from receiving federal funds. And what we're required to do is, as a college, is look and make sure that any vendors that we pass federal funds on, we use COVID relief, for example, money toward, uh, that they are not suspended or debarred. None of them were during the year. However, the process for that COVID relief money being dispersed hadn't set up that internal control process to double check. So there were about 40 total payments that would be above the threshold that would require this process to be there. The reality is most of those payments were to very large vendors, the Dells and big IT companies for remote um, technology. And, but that process to just double check wasn't there. So we are required to report it as a deficiency. These are the two most common findings I've seen this year uh, with most of my colleges and universities have at least one of these two findings because the reality is the emergency nature of the COVID relief, how fast we needed to spend it. It's hard to keep up with kind of the, the moving target of the guidelines that they put out. So we are required to report those findings. It's been the first time in three years that we've had them. Uh, they're about as minor as I can give you though. Other than that, uh, within there uh, is also our report on internal controls and process. We go through what we call a test to design of all the controls and processes at the financial level of the college. Talk through, you know, are we looking at the right approvals for who's approving our vendors, our checks? Are we, who's signing the checks, those kind of things. And so that would, we had a clean report there. So no control deficiencies, no issues there. The processes all looked very good. And that's all I've got for you. Dr. Swally. I just wanted to start off with thanking Chris and Sarah and their team for their work on this. They did remarkable work on this. Um, this audit report was as clean as could be with all the changing dynamics of the HERP funding. And, and I see in other colleges and universities received the same things that were going on this year. So thank you guys for your work on this. Appreciate it. And you've put us in a great um, position to be able to move forward and do a lot of things. So thank you. And I will just echo that, you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, praise the team here in the last seven years. Um, you know, I, again, work with about 15 organizations related to education, and this is consistently one of, if not the best that I work with. Uh, it's, it's an easy to work with them. They communicate well, and the reality is audits are hard, and they have to do their day job while answering 20 questions from me. Um, so I appreciate all the time they give, all the effort they give. Um, it's very much appreciated on our end. Well, it may sound like I'm piling on, but I also would like to commend the group for the work they've done. I've had the pleasure of working with them for the last nine years and spent a lot of time with Chris and Sarah going through budgets and audits. And it's nice to work with such sharp individuals, professionals. One of the things too that could be lost in this too is we look very good financially and we have some money in the piggy bank. And one of the things that could be easily overlooked too is that we're still putting about 2.5 million a year in our capital improvement fund. So we've years ago kind of taken it upon ourselves to try to help fund our projects. And uh, sometimes we get a little help from the state. Sometimes they even give us a little extra help maybe, but for the most part, we've, we've done a lot of it our own. Parker Technical Center being an example. And uh, the Armin was a little different venture with some partners, but uh, I think we're trying real hard to be proactive and forward thinking and, and to have money for not just the rainy day, but for advancing the cause. Uh, con construction's a pretty big thing when you can do it. A lot of, a lot of institutions find that they can't. So I think we've been pretty good stewards there. Any other comments or questions for Barry or for Chris or Sarah? No, yes, would. Mr. Chair. Mr. I would just go ahead. I, I, I was just gonna make a motion that we accept the um, fiscal year 2021 audit. I'll Very second that. A motion and second from Trustee yeah. Wood. Thank you. Uh, unless someone wants to compliment them on the fine work, is there any other comment or question? Okay, on that note, uh, we have a motion. We have a second to uh, 
approve and adopt the audit. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. And the motion carries. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. Next item under new business is tab five. It's an action. It's adopt the trustee zone map. And like the audit, this is one that's on here because we have to get it done by statute and we have a timeline on it. And Chris Martin, you're up, sir. That's it. Yeah. Chairman Ducci, members of the board, thank you again for the opportunity to come before you this evening to talk about the rezoning of the trustee zones. Um, as you're aware, this is a requirement due to the uh, updating of the census. And um, I'm happy to, to share with you tonight, we have Alta Science and Engineering here. Trita Har Harju is with us. And happy to turn the floor over to her to, to provide any questions or comments that, that the board may wanna have a uh, discussion on. We asked um, Alta to provide multiple proposed maps for us. Uh, one of those maps makes um, almost no changes to the, to the trustee zones. Uh, very, very minimal to allow us to meet the population density pieces. And then there were several other proposals that were generated um, through a computer generation process that Tarita would be much more able to explain than I am. So with that, I'll just introduce Tarita and um, have us stand for any questions. Mr. Chair. Trustee Howard. Uh, I would like to make a motion that we adopt proposal alternative number one, just so we've got something to focus on. Uh, obviously, we can talk about the other alternatives, but at least so we know uh, what we're focused on, I would make a motion that we adopt proposed alternative number one. All right. I have a motion to adopt alternative number one. Do I have a second for that? I'll second it. All right. Trustee Wood has seconded it. Um, Ken, if you'd like to start, if you have any comments or questions since you made the motion, sir. Uh, no, I... <clears throat> One of the reasons I made the motion, quite frankly, was um, there were very few changes that altered the boundaries. And um, this isn't just something for trustees, it's also something for voters. And to keep changing or making significant changes in boundaries is a confusing thing. Um, so I, quite frankly, uh, thought that the fewer changes would, would help reduce any confusion about where people need to live in order to run for whatever district and proposal number one seems to accomplish that. Anybody else with comments or questions? Because <clears throat> I do usually try to wait till everybody else has spoken, but I, I'll, I'll just tell you, Ken, I was kind of my thinking also, it seemed like this captured the spirit and intent and what's been done at the, at the state level also to try to keep the changes and keep the electors with the elected together and um, and uh, this does a really good job of that. So it, it does make a lot of sense. No reason to fix it if it's not broke. Um, there is one comment that I have. It's not really a complaint, but in looking at the map, uh, my district is a purple. Yes, sir. And I have more elk in my district than I have people. Yes, sir. That's true. <laughs> Well, you got Christie's, which is kind of about this big, and then you got yours, it's about this big. So you, you have a lot of room to walk anyway. Um, and we're not trying to slight Trustee Wood. She does have the smallest, but she's in the highest density population. So and it's based on population. So it may look a little funny as you, as you look at those, but as Trustee Howard has mentioned, some of the places there aren't a whole lot of people. There might be more deer, elk, or cattle, or occasional moose. Um, anyway, are there any other comments or questions? I, I have a motion, I have a second. Is there any, there's, and there are, as you may be seen, there's an original map, um, and then alternate one, as Trustee Howard mentioned, is the one that's quite similar, and then there were three more other ones that were kind of randomly generated by the computer. And to be quite honest, those three kind of went all over the board they, with substantial changes. And, and it kind of 
broke the idea of keeping people where they were elected by the people that elected them and the zones they represented. So um, one seems to do the best job of meeting that intention. And that's the one that they, they worked on and created. Yes, yes, we did. Yeah, and I'm happy to answer any questions or go through the entire memo, but it looks as if you guys have a good handle on it, so. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else, Tris Tristan? Everybody? All right, so why don't we go ahead and, and put this to a vote. Uh, all those in favor of the motion to adopt NIC, re NIC redistricting proposed alternative one as the new zone map going forward based on the new census, uh, please say aye. 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 All right, the motion carries. Thank you for your work on this. Okay, next under new business, I have a big stack of paper here again with Chris's name on it. <laughs> Mr. Martin, sir. Chair Banducci, members of the board, uh, this evening, um, we would typically come before you and have a discussion about planning for the FY23 budget. And with the transition in leadership, um, we want to take this opportunity just to, to share kind of how this budget is being developed at this point, what we know. And then um, we would be very much open to hearing from, from the board members collectively and individually if there are certain things you would like us to, to present as we develop the budget proposal moving forward. And so just a, a few things I just highlight. Um, our initial planning for this budget includes no tax increase and no tuition increase. We are currently forecasting new property on the rolls of a little more than $325,000. The board will remember that we are working on a, a long-term project that allows us to, through attrition, reduce the overhead of employees on campus by five. That is part of this plan to continue the five position attrition. Um, in looking at our initial plans for enrollment, um, going into next fiscal year. At this point, we are forecasting a 3% decline in enrollment, um, just due primarily to some of the press that, that we've had and the impact that that has on student um, enrollment. Um, we will be looking at a faculty and staff increase, a step increase, and there is a change in the enrollment workload adjustment that we're aware of. That's $174,400 going into this upcoming year. Could you briefly explain that for the folks listening? Absolutely. Because we understand that, but. The enrollment workload adjustment is the state funding model that captures the impact of changes in enrollment. And so we would, we would be receiving a reduction in overall state appropriation by a little bit more than $174,000 due to declining enrollment. And so that is a weighted average against the other uh, community colleges in the state. And for those thinking about it, I think they get a per student like in the K-12. So same thing as the Post Falls or Lakeland or Corlane School Districts, the number of kids, more money, less kids, less money. Yes. And so it's not a per student for us, but it is a, a weighted average over all three other community, all four community colleges now. I would just also just add that we're working really closely um, as the legislative session, it started today, oddly enough, but uh, the, the real <laughs> legislative session coming up um, in January, working on our asks going into the legislative session. And so we were given some really strict guidance again this year on how we could put forth line items. And there was a cap on those line items of 5% of, of our total appropriation, taking into account the enrollment workload adjustment. And so you'll, you'll note that as part of this this year, we were asked to include in our line items the occupancy costs. And so our line items for this year include the occupancy costs for the DeArmond building. We received half of that uh, two sessions ago, we're asking for the additional remaining half, as well as we requested occupancy costs for the Meyer Health and Science expansion. So that's the biggest part of our line item mass this year is occupancy costs. And so that's a change from what we've done in the past. So as we walk forward in the legislative session, you know, we're anticipating there will be um, support for um, change in employee compensation, some other things that will be coming forward on that as the legislative process works its way through. So we think there's more coming our way. And we also are looking forward to potentially getting to expand our lot on requests beyond what's been requested today. 
And so we believe uh, plainly there may be more money on the table for North Idaho College as we go through the legislative session that will impact um, our outlook moving into next fiscal year. Chris, a 5% cap, what does that equate to in, in absolute dollars? We, our total ask this year was a little bit, um, it was about $425,000. How much could we have asked for? Or did we about get to we got, we got our We got our 5% cap. Okay, and that's between the Diarman and the Meyer. And okay. um, some, some support for uh, college and career navigators. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anything else, sir? I mean, just, just uh, again, if the, I know this is a little bit messy tonight, so I apologize, but if there's something specific that the board members would like to see as we put together the packet um, for the first reading of the budget, or if there are um, other planning assumptions that the board would like us to consider, wanted to open this up for that opportunity to collect that. Mr. Chair. Trustee Wood. Could we have some time on that? And maybe individually trustees could send it to you and to Dr. Savali of ideas on how we'd like to move forward. I would very much appreciate that. Thank you. Trustee Howard. Um, in your, um, the handout, you indicated um, about the middle of the page, the overall general fund budget will be flat with the exception of changes resulting from expansion of the Meyer Health and Sciences Building. I thought the Meyer project was being paid for out of a different fund, not the general fund. Uh, Chair Banducci, Trustee Howard, what I'm speaking of there is um, as, as the planning for the Meyer Health Science Building took place, we added additional lab capacity. And so part of the discussion could be if we were to add faculty to support that expansion or staffing to support that expansion, that's where the change would come from. But you're absolutely correct. The building itself was paid for out of capital funds and isn't general, it doesn't impact the general fund. But, but I was speaking to changes that, that we're not aware of yet as we go through this process that might impact staffing specifically from our health and science. Okay. So it relates to staffing, not, not to the building itself. Correct, yes, sir. Thank you. Chris, may I ask a question? And I'm not directing you, and, and this is maybe the other board members can chime in if they'd like to, or oh, certainly they can if they'd like to. <laughs> maybe they will. Um, and for um, Trustee McKenzie and Trustee Barnes, this, this may not make sense. So it's really Trustee Wood and Trustee Howard. But there was a time, and I don't know how much work it was for you. So I, I don't know, just something like maybe you can give us some feedback and um, we can talk to Dr. Sabali about this. Again, not tasking, but where we were getting kind of a monthly synopsis, one page sheet as part of our board book as we were kind of moving through the budget process each year to kind of see where we were on track for that year and kind of what we were doing. And uh, I didn't know, I, I thought there was some value to that, but if it was a lot of work, maybe not, I don't, I don't know. So Chair Benucci, we do that every single month. We do an income statement um, a monthly and a quarterly income statement. Actually, Sarah Garcia does that work for us. Um, and I provide a, if you will, an executive summary that talks about the impacts and the changes each month and how those impacts um, happened and then what we're anticipating happening in future months. And so we, we do that every month now. So we're happy to provide that. Okay. Uh, if that's not too much trouble, I, I, I felt I, I found that to be helpful. I'll work with Dr. Sabali and we'll make sure the board gets those. All right, thank you. I just don't want to create more work for you, but if you guys are producing that, it kind of gives us a, a, an idea of where we're at as we're moving along through the course of the year. And we do that internally as well for the management team so that they have that same information. I think that's, to your point, it's important that we're tracking where we are financially. Okay. Anything else, board? I'll, I'll be brave on this. Trust, Trustee McKenzie? Yes, please. Uh, you don't have to respond right now because it's just an idea. Um, but I do want to make like a a public idea suggestion, just so the whole NIC community can talk about it in their different faculty um, assemblies and, and whatever, and ideas proliferate, um, spread out. Uh, I'm a supporter of uh, those cert degrees, kind of a, a new trend and, and kind of also like boot camps almost where um, one to two weeks and that's, uh, very complicated, not easy to implement, impacts a lot of things. But if that s somehow could work its way into the budget to either be a request or um, 
but it's a it's a big team effort to do that. So I understand. Thank you, Trustee McKenzie, and I will work with Dr. Sabali. Anything else? No. All right, Chris, thank I, you. And I just, are. if thank I you. could just encourage, please feel free to reach out. Uh, I think Trustee Wood's suggestion was good. Any guidance you have for us will help us develop the proposal that will work, hopefully to be valuable to the board. So Chris, is, along that lines, is there anything in particular that you're looking for from us that would be useful or helpful? I, 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 that's kind of a big question. So I don't know how we bound that, but, or, or do you have a thought already of, of, of oh, of topics or subjects or areas that we could be of, of use to you with some input? I think three things come to mind. Um, one is if if there is a desire to do a tax or a tuition change other than, than proposing none, if we have that up front, we can model it. It can be part of the original budget process and submission. Uh, the next thing I would, I would add is we've done a lot of work over the last several years looking at different impacts of taxation as an example. And so I give Sarah credit for that. She's done a phenomenal job of looking at how that impact has changed over time. And so if there if there's information like that, that would be helpful for the board, you know, what the history of salary and benefit changes has been, what the history of tax benefit changes have been, that that's helpful for us so that we can get it in advance so that it, hopefully it informs the conversation early. Um, and then we saw what was in the budget packet last year. We'll, we will work to do that again. But if there's other information, such as staffing or, or pieces that are specific about staffing, if we have that in advance, we can get it to the whole board at the same time and, and use it as part of an informed conversation. Chris, you spurred a question, if I may. You mentioned that there'd be, that you're incorporating a step increase in the budget. The past few years, we've been getting money from the state and it seems like it's been particularly on the CTE side, correct me if I'm wrong, where they were giving us some money, but it wasn't paying for all the raise. It was like a portion of it, like two thirds or something. Or a third. Or a third. Yes, sir. I almost said a third. Yeah. And it, it kind of like, I don't want to say coerces us to do it, but it kind of is, is like, well, you can either you give up the money, but you want to help your people. So you want to do the raise, but now you got to come out of pocket and find, and then it becomes on the base. Are we expecting that sort of, you know? Absolutely we are. Again? We are because the CTE funds come to us and it's fully funding the raise, if you will, for the CTE funded positions. And so if we if we don't accept the money, that's that's an option that we, we assume we have. Um, but the other piece of that is, is the general fund piece usually comes with, with a portion or, or very little state support for those general funded positions. And so that's part of the rub that we have with, with this. Yeah. So overall, we look at the whole college, it works out to about a third is what's, what's funded. That's been a real bane to me. And as a financial guy, I hate that. There's a lot of people who would agree with you. Yeah, I mean, just as a fiduciary, that just seems wrong with it. Anyway. All right, thank you. Thank you. Next on under information items, it's a first reading slash action. It's revised policy 2.01.03 and it is trustee Barnes. Uh, Trustee Banducci, I'd like to make a motion that the board formally adopt Robert's Rules of Order, latest edition, as our governing rules of order for how we conduct board meetings henceforth. And if it is seconded, I will expound upon it. Mr. Chair, Trustee Howard. Yeah. Um, Michael, I, I quite frankly uh, support this, um, but we've had a history of having first and second readings to allow people to comment on it. This particular rule deals specifically with the trustees and, you know, I can see us uh, getting around the second reading in order because it, it, it's a fairly small group that would comment on it. Uh, but that would be my only 
real suggestion is that unless there, you feel there's some emergency to this that we treat it as a first reading and um, make sure it gets on the docket for the next um, next meeting as a second reading, just to follow protocol. So I would make a point of order normally at this point that uh, after a motion is made, a uh, second is, is called for without discussion. Actually, I was gonna say we could have a second and then have the discussion, but um, I, I didn't wanna interrupt and Ken's point was the discussion. So um, how about we do this? Um, I'm gonna say I seconded the motion for discussion. Ken has started the discussion. Uh, continued discussion or Trustee Barnes, would, um, do you have a response back to um, the comments made by Trustee Howard? You're, do you feel, a, 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 what is your com this comfort is, level? This, this, yep, this, this was sort of my point um, in that my hope was to make a motion the way it's prescribed in Robert's Rules of Order await the second and then make a uh, make my opening discussion as the maker of the motion. the motion my intent here was not to say that this is a first reading that's the way it went into the agenda my intent here was to provide a sample of how i would suggest that our policy be modified typically a the rules of order prescribed by a society is stated in bylaws and whereas we do not have bylaws by that name we do have board policies which do specifically have a section called rules of order and in that section the rules of order um, suggest that we will, we will uh, ab abide by uh, Idaho state statute for conducting a, a, uh, our meetings and, and the, the statement afterwards Pardon my stammering, I am tired. <laughs> the uh, Robert's Rules of Order may be used as guidance. And this was part of my um, objection and problem with this particular policy. And I think because of that wording, we as a board, at least for the past year, and from what I understand, possibly years before that as well, uh, that has been given a license to kind of have an, an open uh, scenario where we have like we've experienced tonight, a lot of very uh, uh, contentious uh, situations which are not in keeping with good decorum in a board. And Robert's Rules of Order was built and perfected over 100 some odd years precisely to bring a board into a better role, a better order to conduct business in a proper, respectful decorum and get business done in an efficient and timely manner. And my proposal for us adopting it would then um, necessitate the motion to have the policy rewritten and my follow on motion, should this motion pass, will be to suggest the wording I have there. And if there's any discussion on any changes to that specific wording, we can have that discussion. For instance, I'm trying to keep within my 10 minutes too. I don't know if anybody's timing me. One of the option, one of the uh, statements within Robert's Rules of Order is that every member was, should have the, the opportunity to speak at least only twice and be limited to 10 minutes each. So that would help. So follow on to this would be a rewording and I've had discussions with uh, several others about this and there are local, state and federal rules and statutes which would possibly conflict with a Robert's Rules of Order. Robert's Rules of Order acknowledges this that local state statutes and other laws will supersede Robert's Rules of Order. Where we have um, special ways NIC conducts meetings, we can create by board um, adoption of a two thirds vote of the board to create standing rules to deal with specific ways that we 
conduct board meetings. So that is my uh, motion. Um, I am open to other ideas. Mr. Chair. Trustee Wood. Well, I would like to, uh, I guess I would like to hear from our, like to hear more, I'd like to hear from our parliamentarian, our legal counsel. Mr. Lyons, have you assessed this first reading proposal and do you have some comments you could share? Mr. Chairman, Trustee Wood, um, I, 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 it's just a little history. Um, 20 years ago, the, this, the board did have a, a policy that required uh, adherence to Robert's Rules of Order. And I, just as a matter of history, I, I'll tell you that, that a number of meetings were held and discussions and actions were taken um, uh, where trustees would object to uh, each other's use of Robert's Rules, the, the procedural um, um, motions that were made. We even had people from the public object and, and, and argue that actions that were taken were invalid because they didn't strictly comply with Robert's rules of order. So because of some of those, um, those problems, um, uh, the, the board changed the, this policy 2.01.03 to make Robert's rules of order a, a guideline and that is in part because of those disputes and in part because many of the board members, the trustees who come on are not familiar with the details of Robert's Rules of Order and some of them did not get as familiar as maybe they should have been. So th that's one of the practical aspects uh, of, of making Robert's Rules of Order uh, uh, strictly uh, uh, the procedural um, device that, that you use. Um, I, I would suggest that if the board wanted something a, a little bit more formal, that we would still, the board would still use it maybe as a guideline, but maybe have, have a procedural, and, and I, I, did, I have sent, uh, I have a, a shortened version of it that I think probably fits most of, of what we do, but it's certainly up to the board to make this decision. Um, I, 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 I raise that history because it has the potential to introduce a, one more problematic um, issue and, and issue of contention into the board discussions. That's all I have. I, I have a, Mr. Chair, in one moment, sir. Mark, may I ask you a question, sir? And, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Um, so there's no right or wrong answer here, but Robert's Rules of Orders, I, I don't, I don't know how, I, I know you're familiar with them, but to be a parliamentarian uh, is kind of a unique special thing. If we were to go to Robert's Rules of Orders and you were to act as our parliamentarian, are, are you comfortable that you're versed enough in Robert's Rules of Orders that you would be comfortable with that as a parliamentarian? And I'm not trying to put you on the spot. No, no, that, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Mr. Chairman, let me just say, first and foremost, I am not a parliamentarian parliamentarian does know Robert's rules of order front and back and knows exactly knows how to interpret yeah. them. So that's not me. I just try to give advice to this board to get, keep the meetings moving as best I can. And so that people can understand what the motion is and what the votes are. So no, I would, if, if somebody had asked me to be a parliamentarian, I would have to spend some time studying Robert's rules of order. And I would, I would expect that if the board adopts it, that every board member will spend some time studying Robert's Rules of Order so that everybody's on the same page. But again, I think that just highlights, you know, another element that that that, that uh, uh, can be problematic. Well, and that's why I was asking because the first thing that came to my mind uh, would be that everybody would need some training uh, and some familiar, more familiarity with Robert's Rules of Order. I mean, we're trying to run it, and you and I do the best we can up here. But I'm sure people could pick apart some of what we're doing. It's certainly me. You know, the, the, Mr. Chairman, the point of these meetings is, is that the public can watch the deliberations and listen to the deliberations. And that when decisions are made, that at least they are clear enough in terms of what the motion is and how the votes are counted to decide 
the, the direction that the board is going. Those are the main things, absolutely the main things. So how you get to it, you can throw a lot of procedural um, um, uh, steps into it, or you can accomplish those using Roberts as a guideline. So if, if somebody words a motion differently, or maybe the procedure isn't exactly precise, um, we don't get hung up on it. And uh, we, we just make sure that it's clear what the subject was, what the decision was, and how people voted on it. Trust, that's my thought on it. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Barnes, a, a question for you, sir. Um, would you be willing to coordinate with Mr. Lyons and see what it is that he has uh, developed and see how that looks to you and see if that might be something that might be suitable or, or if you still prefer to, to try to pursue uh, full implementation of Robert's Rules of Orders, but would you be willing to, to maybe defer to the next board meeting and see what uh, what Mr. Lyons has and, and, and see if that's something that would work for you or not? And then, because I think we would have to consider what trustee training would be necessary. And then um, as Mr. Lyons indicated, he'd probably want to brush up on, on Robert's Rules of Orders a little bit more also. Uh, to fulfill the the role of parliamentarian, um, is is that a would that be a reasonable at this time? Uh, or tell me what you're thinking, sir. Trustee Van Ducci, I I am fully uh, convinced that this action needs to happen rapidly as a point of addressing our roles as trustees and demonstrating that we take seriously how we conduct board meetings. Uh, the reading of uh, Robert's Rules of Order looks daunting. It's 633 pages printed. That's the official rule. There is the in brief version, which can be read easily within a couple of hours and gives the basics. I think it's incumbent. I think it should be required of any trustee to be well versed, at least in the in brief. It would then also be the prerogative of any chair to call on a, a subject matter expert parliamentarian. It doesn't necessarily have to be an official parliamentarian, but someone who is willing to act in that role. I know of two personally, uh, one of which actually said he'd be willing to assist uh, without cost. Um, but no, I, I would really like to see us at least adopt the um, motion that we adopted and whether the exact wording needs to be massaged a bit in a second reading, that would be fine, but that would be my second motion. My first motion is that the board commit to adopting formal rules of order and that being Robert's rules of order. Okay, Ms. Uh, Trustee Howard, I think you had a, a comment. Yes. Um. <clears throat> I'm a lawyer and I have spent my life in, um, in a myriad of rules. There are all kinds of rules for lawyers. Um, my experience has been that rules are promulgated because somebody has violated the standard of conduct and therefore there needs to be a rule so everybody knows uh, how to act. But then the rules become the very source of conflict, interpreting the rules as to what they say and what they mean. So there is a place, um, I think, for rules. Um, but any rule is only going to work when people conform to the conduct that is anticipated by the rule. Because when you, the more specific you make the rule, the more likely you have people disagreeing as to what that specificity means. So I'm really on board with what Michael's wanting to do, which is to create an environment of control of the dialogue and the conversation that we have here. Um, I believe that's necessary. But um, I also fear um, the unintended consequences of adopting the specific rules and then them being what we fight over rather than us trying to uh, develop a dialogue that is uh, 
uh, appropriate for what we're trying to accomplish here. So um, the fact that it's recommended, um, I think, uh, fell, tried to cure, I think, that defect that I'm talking about, that the rules become uh, what you fight about. Uh, but maybe it's, um, maybe it's that we need, as trustees, to become familiar with what the, what the intent of the rules are. Uh, we could do that by adopting the rules, uh, as Michael suggests. But um, not having a formal par par parliamentarian, um, we're just as a board who hopefully will um, educate us ourselves in the fundamentals of the rules that we can resolve the issues without getting into great debates over the specificity of a rule. So I like the idea of the concept. Um, it really depends on how we apply it as to whether it's gonna work or not. And if we try and get too specific and critical about it, it's not gonna work. If we ignore the concept, it will work. I mean, if, if we adopt the concept, it will work, excuse me. <laughs> Trustee Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I thought this was just going to be a first reading, so I'm, I'm a little surprised by a motion. I'm, I'm happy to explore this. Um, I agree we need to probably spend a little more time understanding uh, the motions we make and what it means uh, so that we can converse better with each other. So I, I guess I'm really interested in what our attorney has drafted and how that might work for us as an option. But I'm not, I'm not comfortable with a motion tonight to accept something that should be a first reading and it board policy affects the entire board. So we really should, I mean, it's, if it's something that we really wanna work on together, we could have a workshop, we could have a lot of ideas kicked around. Um, I'm just not comfortable moving forward with action tonight. Sure. One of the, just one, one of the things that I have, I don't know if it's in my, it's tab seven. Everybody, does everybody have a, a sheet that says guidelines for meeting rules of order? Anybody else have that? Maybe not. Um, That, that doesn't matter. Trustee McKenzie. Well, I think we are working on this together. I mean, someone proposed something, we're debating it. Everyone, if you want to change the wording, we can. Um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm game to give this a try. Um, and I would love to see a parliamentarian installed uh, for our next meeting. And um, if we can't find one, um, paid or unpaid, I don't, I'll, I'll leave that to Dr. Sabali. Um, or I guess it's, uh, and uh, if we can't find one, then we can always have this policy back in and um, make them back to guidelines. But I say we ex experiment and give it a good try. Michael, would you do me a favor, Trustee Barnes? Explain again exactly what the motion would do, two phased approach that, that you've proposed. My understanding is that the, the process would be that I made a motion, it's been seconded, it needs to be disposed of by a vote. Um, and if it fails, it fails. My motion is that the board formally adopt Robert's Rules of Order, latest edition. If it passes, then that would necessitate an update to our governing policies to reflect that decision. Governing policies related to the board meetings. Right? So you have, a, okay, just a moment, Trustee McKenzie. So you have a red line version of policy 2.01.03. And if your motion, if your motion passes, and we were to accept Robert's rules of order, then that would 
necessitate the update of that policy. And what you've provided us is your first cut or first draft at it. And you would take feedback on this and we would address the policy at the December meeting to try to finalize it to be in accordance with the acceptance of Robert's rules of orders as being our, our guide. Trustee Banducci, that is correct. And I'd like to also uh, reemphasize the fact that where the board has problems with the way Robert's rules of order might apply to the NIC Board of Trustees, we can then uh, create or delineate standing rules of order to govern those areas. And I would also then hope that we would engage a, in a workshop together to work through it. I would even actually prefer that we look into get, getting training from um, an organization that might specialize in training on parliamentary law and Robert's Rules of Order. Mr. McKenzie, do you have something? No, nothing more to say, except I, I like what I'm hearing. I call the question. Can you hold on? Yep. Just for every on that. Good draft. I want to make sure if anybody else has any comments or questions or anything on this, and then because I've got a question, but Christy would. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's not that I disagree with the premise. I I would agree with what Michael's trying to do. I just am concerned that we will create more problems for ourselves than than what we won't arrive at where we want to be. And so um, I'm just not prepared tonight to move forward. Trustee Barnes, um, question for you, if I may. I want to understand the implementation of this as you're proposing it. We have, um, and you're right, Robert's Rules of Orders does take into account if there's local statutes, state statutes, um, board policy, those sorts of things. If, if they take precedent over Robert's Rules of Orders to, you know, to how, how that works if there's a conflict. Are, are you suggesting that, there, that with the rewrite of this policy that there be some words in there that says that we've adopted Robert's Rules of Order with certain caveats uh, that we have some discretion because and I don't know what that looks like exactly. You know, Mr. Lyons has, has put together uh, some, some thoughts. I, I don't know, are, are those types of things that are incorporated into this? I, I like the idea. I, I just feel, I'm just not sure how we end up with this. And, and we're gonna get inputs from each of the trustees maybe before we finalize this at the, say the December meeting. Trustee Van Chuchi. Robert's yes, Rules sir. of Order has been around for many years, adopted by organizations all over the world. The, yes, point, of the, the point of the motion to ask the board to commit to establishing rules of order, rather than just suggesting that a recognized rules of order may be used as a guideline. I think we need better structure and I think we need to commit to it. What it does mean is that as we develop the policy, we can create additional standing rules and um, develop uh, the uh, uh, cheat sheets, if you will, which are, which are plentiful within Robert's Rules of Order anyway to help along help get along with to help us use it and implement it um, 
So, so to let me, let me answer the, the other part of the question. There's an implicit and an explicit way to go about it. The explicit way is to add wording to it, which explicitly states that local uh, state and federal laws may, may supersede Robert's rules of order. That is almost superfluous because within Robert's rules of order, it acknowledges that local laws do supersede anything in Robert's rules of order if they conflict. All right, Mr. Uh, Trustee Howard. Um, I too was a little bit um, confused by uh, the agenda that indicates that this is a first reading on this item, but it's also an action item. So it could be considered um, waiving the, uh, the, the uh, first reading. But what I would like to do, quite frankly, given the discussion we've had here tonight, if there are really two motions that need to be made, one is adopting Robert's rules of order in their entirety. The second motion addressing the appropriate language in our policy um, that would address are having adopted Robert's Rules of Order, which is, I think, the suggestion that Michael has made. I would like to uh, move to table this discussion, treat it uh, almost as a first reading, uh, so that um, if there are some, because I, I think we ought to do both of those things at the same meeting, adopt Robert's Rules of Order if we're going to do it, and then have specific policy language in front of us, some of which he suggested here but there may be some changes to be made. So I would like to think about it a little bit in terms of- I already have a motion in a second though, sir. I think I have to deal with those first. To table? No, sir, I had a motion and a second to adopt. Yeah, I, I don't know that I can take a motion to table while I still have an active motion. No, you can, you can table an existing motion. And you just need a second. That's right. Yeah, I think you're, okay. I was just trying to think through that because we tabled earlier and I think we did the same thing. I'm just trying to figure out if I had to get rid of the first one before I do the second. Obviously, we all need some training on Robert's Rules of Order. Well, <laughs> all of us. Yeah. yeah, I'm not going to claim to be a parliamentarian at all either. We're, we're trying to bug our way through. Anyway, I'm sorry, Ken, keep going. If you... Yeah, that's it. It was a motion to table okay. um, till the next meeting and have specific language available so we can address both of the motions that Michael is proposing. And I'll second that motion. Is that a privileged motion then? Is that how that works? Yeah. Here's, here's my thought. Um, point of order, Todd, Chairman Bendosia. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. What's the point of order, if you have a motion to table in a second, it doesn't go to discussion. All right. Just vote on it. That's, that's the point of that privileged motion is to keep, is to put an end to a and constant to discussion back and forth. I was still formulating a question, but I think I'm done. Um, okay. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, we have the motion to table. We have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Nay. I'm sorry, I didn't hit my button fast enough. <laughs> I am voting in favor to table it so that we can discuss it further. I think I've made my point. So I am in favor of tabling. Uh, I you, hope we should maybe state that there's a time on this one as well. Tabling to what time? Well, for this, I think we need to have this back on the December agenda. And, and I think um, maybe I'm just going to say this. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with trying this. Um, heeding the warnings of our two attorneys because if we do get entangled by it and we decide it's more than we want we can always go back to using it as a recommendation so i think i'm okay because it's not a one-way street we can always we can always come back so let's plan to have the language for the policy and everything available on the december meeting and mr chair just for question who's developing that language well I think trustee Barnes is the belly button, but I think it would be with inputs from the other trustees. And if Mr. Lyons would be willing to share what he has developed 
uh, that would be appreciated also. I, I would, Mr. Chairman, I would be happy to forward to all trustees uh, and, and the administration, the, uh, the basically the one and a half page uh, short form of proceed procedures. Okay, so we, we have tabled that and we will uh, look forward on the December agenda and, and Christy, uh, I'm sorry, Trusty Wood, uh, certainly if you have any inputs or thoughts on that, please feel share, free to share those with Trusty Barnes and anybody else, and then he can get back to the rest of us with what he's got. That would be just fine. Um, partly his point was made, though we do struggle through process and procedure with the meetings and I'll confess I'm doing my best, but I am uh, no expert on Robert's rules of orders. So it's a little, a little cumbersome at times. And I think we're all getting a little tired. And Michael, I think you're on a, a different time zone a couple hours ahead of us. So you've got to be about exhausted. All right. Um, next item is uh, the board chair report. I don't think I need to add anything to tonight. Any remarks for the good of the order? Dr. Sabali. Um, I wanted to first off um, thank Dr. Stanley and Dr. Burns as they're getting into their last couple board meetings for their years of service to this and wish them luck in their future endeavors. Um, this place is forever in gratitude for you. And the other thing that I wanted to encourage is when you guys are leaving tonight, everybody that's here, please be careful as there were a lot of high winds tonight and who knows what it's going to look like after the four plus hours we've been in here. So please be careful as you're leaving and uh, drive home safely because there might be some power lines and tree branches down as you're leaving. Trustees, anything else? All right, I declare this meeting adjourned.